Welcome to the City Council's June 28th regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers in accordance with public health guidelines for in-person meetings and participating remotely to promote social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Jen Willison, City Council members Drew Combs and Cecilia Taylor. Council member Ray Mueller will be joining us shortly. Staff present include Interim City Manager Justin Murphy, City Attorney Nira Doherty, and City Clerk Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Thank you, Mayor Nash. And again, echoing a welcome to our regular June 28th City Council meeting. For those of um, you who are participating via Zoom, if you wish to provide comment on an item after the mayor calls for public comment on that item, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. And if you are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine at that time for any members of the public who are participating in chambers. Once Mayor Nash calls for public comment on that item, we ask that you make your way up to the podium. That does conclude my introductions at this time. Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. Agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member reports. I would like to make a motion that we reorder the agenda in order to hear item G1 related to the budget once the full council is present. Is there a second on the table? Second. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, please state the motion and call for the vote. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Nash, a second by City Council Member Combs to reorder the agenda in order to hear item G1 related to the budget once the full City Council is present. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Woolison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Mueller absent. Thank you. Thank Madam, you. Madam Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt. May I just ask, uh, request a point of clarification in the event the full council is present remotely or in person um, prior to the G1 agenda item coming up? I assume your motion um, anticipates that the agenda will continue in its current order. Exactly. That will be called forward. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Does the city council wish to pull or modify any other agenda item? All right, thank you. Public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. I will call for public comment at the appropriate time for members of the public to address the city council on any item under ag agenda sections, consent calendar, public hearing, regular business, informational items and closed session. City Clerk Heron, please call for general public comment. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item D public comment for items not on tonight's agenda, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Vicki Robledo.
Thank you very much, Ms. Robledo. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Mary Pimentel. Hi, I did not mean, mean to speak. I did not know how to put my hand down. Sorry. No problem. Thank you so much. So this will be the final call for general public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. Councilmember Combs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nash. I wanted to, to respond generally to Ms. Rubledo's comment. Now, now I can't speak broadly about, about the removal of trees, but I can speak about the, the interchange at Willow and Highway 101. And my understanding from the last update we received uh, regard, from staff is that the landscaping plans for the interchange conceptual designs will come to city council for review and approval next month. And so, so there are plans. Um, I share your concern about the long uh, term uh, dirt mounds that have existed at that, that, that inner, inner um, interchange on both sides of, of the freeway. Uh, yeah, um, and, and um, I, I know Council Member Taylor and I have been um, pushing strenuously for, for that to be prioritized. And, and, um, and, and my understanding, again, like I said, is that, that conceptual designs will come to the, to the City Council for, for review and approval next month. Thank you very much. Closed session public comment. We are offering two opportunities for public comment on the closed session. The second call for public comment on the closed session item will be before adjourning to closed session later in the meeting. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comment for closed session item K1. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our closed session item K1, closed sessions for conference with labor negotiator related to the unrepresented employee of city manager, Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine. For anyone participating in person, feel free to step up to the podium. This will be the final call for closed session public comment on item K1 at this time. We do have one hand raised. Um, the name coming in is call in user two. I will ask that you uh, state your name for the record. Looks like you are off mute and able to address the city council at this time. So for call in user number two, looks like you are off mute and able to provide any comment at this time related to item K1. Give this just a couple more seconds. So I've asked our caller to unmute on their device. It does not look like they are able to either unmute themselves or engage a microphone at this time. So for call in user, uh, do note that we will have a second call for public comment on this item. Um, you can also email your public comment to us, uh, the Menlo Park CCIN, which is city.council at menlopark.org. Thank you. So this will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item K1. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. 
And we've had uh, messages that there was no audio for the public comment that was given in the chamber. And I believe that has now been rectified. So in the future, we will have that uh, microphone working. Thank you. Consent calendar. Under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. Are there any city council discussion or questions on the consent calendar? City Clerk Heron, could you please call for public comment on the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our consent calendar item, E1, the city council meeting minutes, E2, a resolution to continue conducting city council and advisory body meetings remotely, E3, amendment to an agreement with Aptium Environmental and Infrastructure, E4, a resolution authorizing staff to submit applications to the MTC for one Bay Area grant program, E5, the resolution Adoption of a resolution of intention to abandon public service easements at Jefferson Drive and Constitution Drive for Menlo Uptown. And E6, adoption of a resolution uh, updating the investment policy for the city. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline cell phone, please press star nine. And if you are participating in person, please feel free to step up to the podium. This will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items E1 through E6. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. Is there a motion and a second on the table to approve the consent calendar? Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, I move to approve the consent calendar. Councilmember Taylor. I'll second. City Clerk Heron, please could you state the motion and call for the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Willison, a second by City Council Member Taylor to approve the consent calendar. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Mueller absent. Public hearing. These public hearings are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. The first public hearing is F1, adopt a resolution overruling protests, ordering the improvements, confirming the diagram area of assessment and ordering the levy and collection of assessments for landscape assessment district for fiscal year 2022-2023. To introduce the item is Associate Transportation Engineer, Esther Young. Good evening, Mayor Nash and members of council. My name is Esther Zhang, Associate Transportation Engineer. Tonight, I will be introducing item on Landscape Assessment District. Landscape Assessment District collects funds to be used for maintenance of city street trees, sidewalks damaged due to city street trees, as well as street sweeping. District was established in 1983 for the maintenance of street trees, and it was updated in 1990 to include assessment for the repair of sidewalk da damaged by street trees. The assessments are subject to annual adjustment based on the engineering news record construction cost index for the San Francisco Bay Area. And for fiscal year 2022-2023, the engineer's report proposes 3% increase for tree maintenance and 3% increase for sidewalk maintenance. An annual action is required by city to continue collection of assessments. And every year we go through the three-step process as shown here. On March 8th, um, city council initiated the landscape assessment district 
proceedings and adopted a resolution directing preparation of engineer's report. On May 24th, City Council adopted two resolutions, one giving a preliminary approval of the engineer's report, and second was a resolution of intent to order the levy and collection of assessments. Tonight, the City Council is here to consider the resolution overruling protests and ordering the levy and collection of assessments. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions from City Council before we open the public hearing? I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comments on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item F1, adopt a resolution overruling protests, ordering the improvements, confirming the diagram area of assessment and ordering the levy and collection of assessments for landscaping assessment district for fiscal year 2022-23, Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. For those in person who wish to speak on this item, please approach the podium. And our first speaker will be Pam Jones. Thank you, Pam Jones, a uh, resident in the Bellhaven neighborhood. Um, uh, mayor, vice mayor, and council members. Um, I'm still confused on how it's determined how much you pay for this um, tree assessment. And I asked that last year, and I'm asking it again because I do not have physically have any trees, city trees on my yard or in front of my house. Um, so I would assume that this amount is to cover the sidewalks, but since I don't have any trees that would buckle the sidewalk, then I shouldn't have to, to pay a fee. So I would just really like to have clarification as to um, what fee that I am paying for and, and to make sure that it is the correct fee. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on our first public hearing, item F1. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and open for city council discussion. What a, um, Ms. Jung, could you please um, answer Ms. Jones's question about the tree assessments for houses that do not have um, trees in their uh, street trees, please. Hello, Ms. Nagaya. Good evening, Mayor Nash. I'm Nikki Nagaya, Public Works Director for the city. Um, so I think we fielded Ms. Jones' question last year, so I, I was following up to, to hopefully answer the question. Um, in general, uh, properties that do not have street trees do pay a, a different assessment amount um, compared to those that, that do not. Um, I'm trying to pull up the specific information for, for her property. We can follow up with her individually um, to, to make sure that um, it's clear which situation applies and that the fees are being um, administered correctly. But in, in general, there are differences in the assessment value um, that's assessed for properties, what, whether or not there is a tree present, whether or not there's curb gutter sidewalk present, uh, and then a, a base ass assessment amount for, for other properties. Thank you. Are there any questions from city council members? Is there a motion and a second on the table? Councilmember uh, Combs. I'll move. A second. Thank you. Um, City Clerk Karen, could you please state the motion and call for the vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. 
So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Combs and a second by Vice Mayor Willison to adopt a resolution overruling protests, ordering the improvements, confirming the diagram and area of assessment and ordering the levy of collection of assessments and increasing the tree assessment by 3%, which amounts to an increase of $2.57 per single family equivalent per year and the sidewalk assessment by 3%, which amounts to an increase of $1.38 uh, per single family equivalent per year and for the landscape assessment district for fiscal year 2022-23. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Willison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Mueller absent. Thank you. The next public hearing is F2, certificate of sufficiency of the petition for the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsored initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated and zoned for single family detached homes. To introduce the item is city clerk Judy Heron. Thank you, Mayor Nash. And again, hello, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members. The item before you this evening is a receive and file item accepting the certification of the sufficiency of the petition for the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsored initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the City Council of the City of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated and zoned for single family detached homes. According to elections code 9114, it requires that the city elections officials certify the results provided by the County of San Mateo's Office of the Assessor, County Clerk, Records and Elections, which is provided in attachment A, determining the proposed initiative qualifies for the ballot. For some background on this item, on April 15th of 2022, the initiative proponents submitted a notice of intent to circulate a petition uh, per election code 9203. The city attorney's office prepared the ballot title and summary, which was provided to the proponents on April 30th of 2022. The proponents published a notice of intent on May 4th, 2022 in the examiner and, filled and filed the affidavit of publication with the city clerk on May 10th of, of 2022. The petition was filed by the proponents on May 24th of 2022, bearing 2,976 unverified signatures. And on June 15th of 2022, the county notified the city that 2,011 signatures had been verified which exceeded the minimum of 1,984 signatures to qualify uh, the proposed ballot initiative. The city clerk has determined that the proposed initiative qualifies for the ballot. In your next agenda item F3, the city council will take action on the proposed initiative. At this time, staff is seeking the city council to accept the certification of sufficiency and no formal action is recommended or required. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions from City Council before we open the public hearing? I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Karen, could you please call for public comments on this item? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item F2, Certificate of Sufficiency of the Petition for the Proposed Initiative Measure entitled a Citizen-Sponsored Initiative Measure to Amend the Land Use Element of the General Plan to Prohibit the City Council of the City of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated for zoned for single-family detached homes. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. For members of the public who are participating in person, please feel free to proceed to the podium. Good evening, council members, once again. Um, I wanted to bring up and address the fact that I was confronted by one of the individuals in my community. I, I reside in Belhaven, Madeira Avenue. And on, uh, I can't remember what day it was, but I do remember walking out into my front yard and a gentleman confronted me 
about the petition. And I was just about ready to sign it. And then I asked him, because he was saying that the council members all supported it. And then he supposed, and I said, really, that's interesting. I said, could you tell me who? And he named specific uh, council members. And at that point, I knew that this was false. Uh, and so I told him that I was really su surprised that they were even you know, circulating this or trying to get signatures in the community. And he said it was supported by many people in the community, including council members. So he re-emphasized re that again. And I already had the pin in my hand. But I also, you know, I'm familiar with some of the council members and I knew they wouldn't be supportive of that particular petition. And then he left. He seemed very surprised when I uh, confronted him and I was upset. And so I jumped on my bike and I went around and saw around four or five people in the community doing this. And I confronted a couple as they were confronting another family member. And um, they were very taken back by us telling them that they were not, that council members were not, to the best of my knowledge, supporting this. So I feel like there was a lot of uh, misinformation that was given on that petition. And it just felt very, uh, very violated in the sense that they were coming and feeding us misinformation to get that petition signed. So I just wanted to address that. And I just, one last thing, um, last weekend's Juneteenth Festival that the community put on was really, really, uh, an extraordinary, nice, intimate, sweet uh, celebration. And I wanted to thank the people that put that together. I think it was Bellhaven Action Committee. And it was just a really wonderful event. Uh, I wish a lot of people when I saw many people there. And it just proves to the beauty of our small community with that diversity. And that's what Bellhaven and Menlo Park is about. So I thank everybody that put it together and those who attended. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on public hearing item number F2. And our next speaker will be Lynn Bramlett. Good, good evening, Council. This is Lynn Bramlett, a member of District 3. And I too was approached to try to galvanize my neighbors by one of the lead organizers of this petition who mistakenly thought I would be galvanizing my neighbors into a signature um, you know, um, meetup, if you will. And when I explained a bit of the history of the Connect Menlo so-called general plan update, uh, went into detail about the unfair practices that took place in District 1 and that have never been acknowledged um, and yet are quite obviously did not follow state law for a general plan update, I never heard again. And part of their petition, I'd actually looked, seen a sign for it and researched it before I was contacted. Um, they mistakenly think those guiding principles are anything more than platitudes because they were never measured, never reported. And so um, I think we're now in a mess because of our prior practices. And I, I, think, I think more needs to come out about the truth about Connect Menlo, the background, and more done to help right that egregious wrong that took place. And so, um, I don't have, I didn't plan to speak tonight on it, but I, I definitely think more is going to come out about that. And I think this can be an opportunity to admit error and to have some healing as part of the process. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Michal Bortnik, followed by Ken Chan. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michal Bortnik, and I'm a District 4 resident. Uh, so first, I'd like to walk through how we got to this point, at least how I understand it, because I think it's relevant to this conversation. Uh, so as part of the housing element work, the flood school site was identified as a promising site, a potential site. Uh, and the, the owner, Ravenswood School District, expressed interest in developing the site uh, to provide 100% affordable housing, teacher housing, uh, and might actually be the only property owner to do so in the entire housing element. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but that seemed like a very, uh, very few opportunities were actually matched with expressed interest. Uh, and then a group of 
uh, District 2 residents organized to oppose it um, at the different housing element and city council meetings, uh, but didn't succeed at preempting uh, the possibility of, of development on this site. Uh, uh, but then the group found a technicality in how the flood school site is zoned, uh, which I still don't understand how a school site is zoned as a single family housing. Uh, but we wouldn't actually be having this conversation if uh, if that school site wasn't zoned that way. And uh, this group took advantage of that technicality to craft a ballot measure that would prevent the Ravenswood School District from building affordable housing for, for its teachers and staff. Uh, but that measure doesn't actually mention anything about what it was designed to accomplish and doesn't explain the impact it's going to have. And that feels very disingenuous to me. Because uh, to make an informed choice, I believe the voters deserve to know the motivation behind the measure, or at the very least, know the impact the measure will have, uh, especially that it's, given the circumstances, quite likely to disproportionately affect underserved communities. So I strongly support the option to order a report. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Ken Chan, followed by Katie Baruzzi. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, try that one more time, Ken. Sorry about that. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, that's much better. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Um, good evening, uh, my Mill Park City Council members. My name is Ken Chan, and I'm an organizer with the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Uh, we work with communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality affordable homes in San Mateo County. Um, I'd first like to thank staff for all of their hard work in putting together their report regarding this initiative. And on behalf of HLC, I'd like to urge uh, council tonight to commission a 30-day impact study on this ballot initiative. It's vital that you and your community members have all of the facts on hand so everyone is able to make an informed decision. Thanks so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Katie Baruzzi, followed by Leslie Feldman. Hi, uh, Katie Baruzzi, member of the Complete Streets Commission um, and speaking for myself as usual. Um, I wanted to comment, um, I, I echo um, previous commenters who are um, asking uh, for the council to commission an impact report. And I appreciate um, Michal's excellent summary of how we got here. I will also say that I find, um, you know, having looked at citywide zoning maps, I find the ballot language really um, to be a little bit confusing and misleading. So um, the thing that people are gonna be voting on is um, should the city of Menlo Park be able to rezone or redesignate properties that were zoned or designated for single family detached homes? And, um, and of course, a lot of the land that happens to be zoned R1 or R1U or RE in our city um, has never had single family detached homes or maybe, you know, back in the days of James Flood. Um, but, you know, we're talking about Vallambrasa, we're talking about um, church parking lots, uh, we're talking about, you know, all kinds of locations. We're talking about Flood School, which again, um, really curious about how that change happened and when. And so I worry that if we don't have some clear communication from the city about what the implications are of this and what they mean down the road for various um, institutions, public serving institutions in our community and how they might limit the rights of those institutions to build housing that would support their communities, um, I think that we might have a mess on our hands. So I hope that um, we can ward off unintended consequences, um, examine what this means for us and, and clarify for the public as soon as possible uh, what the impact of this ballot initiative would be if it succeeded. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. So I do just wanna remind uh, folks who do have their hands raised, the item before us at this time is the certificate of sufficiency for the petition. Um, this is not the item that council has any action on. Our next item, F3, um, does propose the three options for the city council related to this ballot measure. So I do want to just, I just want to provide that clarification. 
So if there's any further speakers on F2 related to the certificate of sufficiency of the petition, go ahead and engage that hand feature at this time. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and open for city council discussion. There's no city council comments. Do we need to, it says no action that we will just go ahead and file, uh, receive and file the petition. Thank you. So the final hearing today is F3, determination of action pursuant to elections code section 9215 regarding the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsored initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park from redesignating or re rezoning certain properties designated and zoned for single family detached homes. To introduce the item is city attorney Nira Doherty. Thank you, council member, Mayor Nash, Nira Doherty, city attorney. I will um, start off by providing a brief overview of the initiative petition, explain where we are in the process, and then set out um, the options that are available for the council this evening. So the citizen sponsored initiative um, that the council is considering this evening um, was uh, brought forward by proponents some months ago with a um, initiative, proposed initiative measure that would amend the general plan of the city of Menlo Park to prohibit the city council from taking certain actions on property uh, and parcels that have been zoned as of April 15th, 2022, single family residential. And there are a number of single family residential designations currently in the general plan that would be um, essentially frozen in place until um, amended by a further vote of the people. The council would uh, no longer have the opportunity to revise or rezone or reset designate those certain properties in the zoning districts, um, in certain zoning districts in the city. And those zoning districts include properties that are designated very low density residential or low residential and zoned RE, RES, R1S, R1S, R1U, R1ULM um, as of April 15th, 2022. So the elections code is very prescriptive in the process for moving an initiative measure forward. Once the uh, signatures on the petition have been certified, which is the agenda item that the city council just heard, the council, the city council must take one of three actions under the election, under the elections code. And those actions are before you this evening. The first action that the council could take is to adapt the initiative measure itself. The impacts of that would be that the city council would essentially be adopting the general plan uh, amendments that are set forth in the proposed initiative measure. The council may also elect to submit the initiative measure to the voters without alteration. And lastly, the council may elect to direct staff and order a report pursuant to elections code section 9212. The elections code sets forth the contents of such a report and also specifies that the city council may direct that other matters um, be included in the report. If the council does elect to proceed with ordering the report, staff would rec uh, staff would request that the council provide any direction it seeks appropriate on additional items, matters, and subjects to be addressed in the report. If the council doesn't provide such direction, staff is prepared to uh, move forward with the uh, subject matters that are set forth in elections code section 9215. And if there are questions on uh, utilization of staff versus a contractor, I would turn to our um, city manager to address that. Those um, recommendations have been set forth in the staff report that's before you this evening. 
Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions from city council before we open the public hearing? Council Member Combs. Yeah, thank you. Um, so city attorney Doherty, normally a council can't take actions that bind another council, like right, um, or restrict something to a future voter initiative. Um, in theory, the future council could just redo that. Is it because of the parameters by which we are seeing this issue where if we did adopt it, it would then be a change that would be, that would require a future uh, voter <laughs> voter led uh, change to to uh, you know low density zoning yeah that's exactly right so there's a provision of the elections code which says exactly what you just said which is if an initiative if an initiative qualifies for the ballot by um, obtaining sufficient signatures to qualify and the legislative body adopts that measure itself then it adopts it in full and it cannot be amended by a vote of the people if that is so specified in the measure. You, it, it can't be amended by a, a future city council is what Correct, you're, yeah. I apologize if I misspoke. But it, it can be amended, amended by, it can you. only be amended by a future vote of the people, right? Yeah. That's right, if it so specifies. So I heard what you thought you said, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I looked at the vice mayor and it's clear that she heard what you said. <laughs> and so I want to clarify that. As I said, you're a better city attorney than I am sometimes. Thank you. Um, I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Heron, please call for public comments on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our final public hearing, F3, Determination of action pursuant to election code section 9215 regarding the proposed initiative measure entitled a citizen sponsor initiative measure to amend the land use element of the general plan to prohibit the city council of the city of Menlo Park from redesignating or rezoning certain properties designated in the zone for single family detached homes. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. If you're with uh, joining us in chambers, please feel free to step up to the podium. And our first speaker will be Vicki Robledo. Good evening again. Um, I just want to state how strongly I am in support of the rezoning there and adding those homes there uh, at that location where the school is at. I went by there recently. I also know that as a resident of Bellhaven, that I am at a point where I'm pretty furious at the fact that we are being bombarded with over 4,000 homes three new hotels, and our air quality has already been proven that it is the worst in all of Menlo Park. We are in a square box, as you know, Marsh, Willow, 101, and Bayfronts. We're in a drought, and yet I still keep seeing lawns being planted like crazy and our trees being torn down. I see space throughout Menlo Park, all the way up to Alameda de las Pulgas, all the way to up Sand Hill, but yet the focus has been Bell Haven. And I think the community now is at a point where we've had it. You know, we have people coming into our community to sign false petitions. And it's at a point where, you know, we're really requesting the support from city council, from planning commissions, that we need to halt some of this building that we're putting in Bellhaven and distribute it, which is what we've been requesting for years to distribute it evenly throughout. It seems that the departments tend to focus on Bellhaven like it is the only space to build. And it isn't. And we are literally being poisoned in our own communities. Well, Bellhaven specifically. And I don't understand why I drive on Middlefield Road and I see the, the convent, I think, or whatever it is, a big empty plot of land right there. I see these buildings that are pretty nice, the architectural designs, the SRI, that is right next to the transit corridor. I mean, if you want to eliminate traffic and pollution, put housing where people can access transportation, our Dumbarton Rail, don't know what happened with that. So it's at a point where I think we really need to, well, at least many of us are starting to demand that the cities really redirect their efforts and start distributing the housing equal, well, not even equally, just distributing outside of specific areas in this and rezoning. Bellhaven has been rezoned how many times already? Rezone other areas in Menlo Park. I mean, it really is blatantly, in my opinion, 
a little bit of choice of modern day redlining and racism. Let's put it, call it what it is. So I think we really need to think about how we are planning the future for this community and retaining our communities that bring and welcome the diversity that makes Menlo Park what it is. And so I ask that you really focus on how we can keep this community diverse and really equally distributing the housing and the businesses. Let's put some hotels over west of 101. Let's put some 4,000 housing over there. And let's do sunset, the building over there. Let's tear that down and build some housing. That's how we feel. So we're asking that I'm asking and almost pleading to really help the community stay there intact and look at other areas that we can really distribute it and stop promoting separatism in our communities. Thank you, and I appreciate all that you do. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Leslie Feldman, followed by Pam Jones. Hello, and thank you for taking my comment. My name is Leslie Feldman, and I'm a resident in the Flood Triangle neighborhood. I uh, Leslie, we're having a little difficulty uh, hearing you. If you can get a little bit closer to your mic. Oh, sorry about that. Is this better? Yes, thank you. Okay. So my name is Leslie Feldman. I am a resident of the Flood Triangle neighborhood. I um, thank you for taking my comment today. I want to express um, my strong opposition to the proposed ballot measure. Um, as Vicki just stated, we need more housing, but it, the, but we do, do not we need it distributed in other parts of Menlo Park, not only Be Bell Haven. And I fear that, I, I know that this initiative will stand in the way of that progress. We need an independent study for factual information about what this proposal, this ballot initiative will do to our community. Um, and, and so I'm calling for the, for the council to move in the direction of the independent fact-finding study. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Pam Jones, followed by Rebecca Barnes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members, and staff. I strongly urge the council to order a report by experts in this area so that we can all have the same correct understanding so we're all speaking the same language. As one of those Bellhaven residents who was given misinformation by the canvassers, it really concerns me that even the people that are promoting this may not understand what it is. So the only way that we're all gonna be on the same page is if the experts explain it to us. Um, I also want to thank uh, Ms. Robledo for her comments, um, and she does express the sentiment of many residents in the Bellhaven neighborhood. So again, uh, thank you, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on item F3. And I will go to Rebecca Barnes. Um, good evening. My name is Rebecca Barnes. I am a project manager at MidPen Housing Corporation. MidPen manages 131 homes in Menlo Park. And once the construction of Gateway Rising is complete, this number will grow to 271. We are also working with the US Department of Veterans Affairs to provide additional affordable homes on their campus in connection with the city's housing element. Given the options you are choosing from tonight, we are in support of the city council ordering a report. MidPen has worked closely with this council and commend them on supporting affordable housing directly and also more generally through policies and procedures that have been updated in the contemporary era, including affir affirmatively furthering fair housing and the thoughtful way the city has undertaken the update of the housing element. It is worth mentioning that this is a sea change. Even 10 years ago, the city had a track record of dodging housing obligations that are widely understood to be a corollary of job growth and was considered to be a bad actor such that they were targeted for non-compliance on the housing element via public interest law and advocacy groups. 
Requiring a vote of the people in order to produce new affordable homes will have a detrimental effect on affordable housing development and preclude the development of church and school sites, which are uh, some of the best places to consider due to being mission aligned or, or already held as a public asset. We are deeply concerned that this ballot measure as is will be a step backward for the city. We further wanna lift up that there is a different philosophy, philosophy at the state level with the creation of the Housing Accountability Unit at the State Department of Housing and Community Development and the role Attorney General Rob Bonta plays in enforcing state housing law. Adoption of the proposed initiative will contradict the state housing priorities, but most importantly, this will negatively impact the prospect of affordable development in Menlo Park for the foreseeable future. Again, thank you for the consistency and level of certainty this council has brought to the development process. There are many jurisdictions that continue to be collaborative and embrace a future where the height and density needed in order to bring affordable homes online can move forward. Thank you again. Thank you for your comment. And our final speaker will be Ken Chan. Hello, um, my name is Ken Chan. I'm an organizer with the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Um, I just wanted to reiterate uh, uh, our urging of the council tonight um, to commission a 30-day impact study of this ballot initiative. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. With no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. I will now close the public comment and open for city council discussion. Would anyone, council member Combs. Yeah, actually, so this is a, a question to, to staff. Um, there was the issue brought up in connection with the current zoning of, of this site. And, and so I do think it's it's in speaking of like information or misinformation or disinformation um, or lack of just the right information. Um, um, because against against one of the speakers made it seem as though it was it was it was it was strange. And so my understanding and and then I'll go through my understanding and ask that the city manager <coughs> excuse me, or so, someone on staff to, to correct me as, as needed, is that at one point the zoning of this site some many decades ago reflected the zoning of that you typically have for school, whether it's its public facility or, or something to that effect. At some point, some decades ago, a city council in Menlo Park decided to change the zoning, right? and, and that would have happened in the same process, uh, public hearings and meetings um, requiring any, any zoning change. And, and for what reasons, we don't exactly know, but, but it was a, a change done by a, a prior Menlo Park City Council, again, some decades ago. And so that's my understanding. And, and so I just asked um, uh, to, to make sure that we're all dealing with, uh, at least as much as we can, the same fact pattern. Um, the staff to let me know uh, if that's in line with their historical understanding or if they understand something different. So I'm just trying to gauge uh, the, the best person to, to field the question. Um, so if you're looking for a high level response, uh, I can uh, uh, agree that at uh, one point in time, the property was uh, zoned public facilities and it was zoned, rezoned to residential single family. I believe that was in the 1980s. There's been a number of questions about that. We're in the process of doing the proper research, making sure that we have all our facts straight, and we intend to then share that history shortly. And so that's where I would need to check with others about um, how close we are to being able to share that. Okay, that that's um, helpful. Helpful. And, and and is is there an ETA regarding sort of or some sense of like? when and what what form sharing that information will will take good evening or... please go ahead thank you Marnash, good evening, and thank you. Um, I'm Deanna Child, the assistant community development director. So I think I missed a little bit of the transition. Um, but I, I heard um, at what point would we have the zoning history for the flood school site, um, and we are wrapping that up. 
I know there were a number of questions also about the flood school site. And so we have um, prepared a question and answer or a, an FAQ for the site, which would include the history of the zoning of uh, the site. And so our, our goal is to have that up on our web page um, by the end of this week. Thank you. Other questions from council? Council Member Combs. Well, I, I don't have a, a, a question per se. I can just provide a comment. I, I mean, Please. Um, I, I think my understanding again is that we have three options. We can adopt, adapt it. We can, um, uh, uh, you know, call, call for, uh, take whatever steps to, to tee this up to be a, a measure, an initiative. Or we can we can request a report. I, I think the um, the best thing to do in the situation is request a report, um, and then of, of course then we'll, we'll get the report, um, and then be left with the final two options <laughs> at some point at a later date. Uh, I, I guess my question, I, I guess I did would have a question is is what are the parameters or framing staff is thinking of in connection with the report. And, and is there some specific questions or direction in connection with the report that you know that you have or want from, from council? Uh, let's see, I can take the, the first stab at this may request some uh, assistance from others. Um, sorry, this is a pretty awkward setup with where the microphone is and where I need to look. So every time I, I get a kink in my neck. Uh, let's see. So uh, state law prescribes um, specific things to be can be covered. And so that's on um, uh, page F-3.4 of the staff report. And so the, the first seven are things that um, uh, would uh, definitely be included in the report and we'll just be um, reviewing them for the applicability related to this specific initiative. But we would, um, my, my expectation is we would systematically go through those seven items and anything that's um, applicable would be uh, something that would be uh, covered, addressed in this report. So I think that that list, if there happens to be um, questions on that, feel free to, to pose those questions. We have not uh, started in on, um, on the study or the report. We're waiting for, for council direction on that. So then the, the one item that is somewhat open-ended is uh, item eight, any other matters, the legislative body. So in this case, the city council request to be in the report. So that, that I think may be um, the, the one item that would be worthy of some council um, consideration. There, there may be some questions that the council has that potentially are covered through one through seven, but um, it's probably better to hear from the council uh, this evening and um, we can consider that in moving forward with the report. But I think if there is something specifically that the council is interested in, it'd be good to make sure that there's a um, majority uh, interest in, in that. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there are um, time constraints given the 30-day timeline, and there's also resource constraints between the availability of consultant staff. This will be a priority to produce such a report if, if requested, but it's um, um, we will need to have some uh, focus on the, the most important relevant items. So that's kind of a quick overview. Happy to see if uh, Ms. Chow or uh, City Attorney Doherty has anything to add on that or if there's follow-up questions from the council. I, I can sort of give the council an overview of what we typically see in these elections code. 9212 reports. Um, as the city manager said, typically you'll see the rundown of all of the topics prescribed by the elections code and where they're, they are not applicable. Um, the report will note that. So for example, um, 
there may be no impact on agricultural lands from this initiative. And so the report would likely state that and then uh, move on to impacts on open space and traffic congestion. Um, the report does have to be a factual and unbiased um, analysis that weighs the factors um, directed by the council or if none are directed, we would just utilize the factors and subjects prescribed in section 9212. Um, the reports are um, uh, do not provide an opinion or a position on the measure, but provide um, a background and factual uh, analysis on the various um, the various subjects. Thank you. So I would um, we had uh, CCIN an email come into uh, the CCIN council email, and I would like to just highlight that um, to the extent that we can add racial and economic equity, educational equity. Um, I would like to do that. I believe that the other two items that were listed, which is Menlo Park's ability to comply with state housing laws, including production of affordable housing and affirmatively furthering fair housing, and also climate and traffic impacts of people driving to or through Menlo Park for work because they cannot afford to live here, I believe are already listed under the, um, the seven items that are there, but I would like to just make sure that we're, we cover all of those to the extent possible. Any other council comments? So hey, if, I, if I may, if I could just confirm which CCIN that was, because then we can go back and refer that. And then if we could just get confirmation that there's majority support from the city council. So this was um, from Ms. Grove on at 12.18 today, um, entitled item F3, study the impacts of the proposed measure. And I guess um, I would just add to that, that if there are, um, if anything creates a tremendous amount of staff time, certainly please um, make a judgment. Um, but I, I would like to see those included if possible. Council Member Combs. Oh, ah, Council Member Taylor, please. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I, I'm supportive of, of including those items to be um, studied in the report. And then also the impacts of the zoning changes to existing sites that were selected for the housing element. Council Member Combs. Th thank you. So I, I just pulled up um, Ms. Groves. Uh, CCIN email. And so generally speaking, I have no objection, of course, but it, it is in the details. I And and my concern is that, is that we go into, or, or, or this goes into um, an issue of, of sort of editorializing. Um, and, and that is, is my, like my, my concern. Um, and, and so I, I don't know like how, like if there are, given that like there are lots of of, or not lots, but certainly there are other examples of, of these types of reports um, under, you know, the same sort of auspices of a, of a potential voter initiative. If there exist some examples, then I'm more comfortable with, with delving into these things um, of racial and economic equity. Um, but if there, if there doesn't, then, then I'm, I'm more concerned. And it has to do not with what is said there, but the integrity of the report. Right and, and how it's viewed in, in the community. And the more and more in which it is different than how these reports have looked other places in the state, I think the more and more we open ourselves up um, uh, to uh, suggestions or concerns, again, that, that we, are, we are trying to um, have the report say a certain thing. Um, I agree. And I was, um, I assume as we add these, that these will be in the same vein of the unbiased um, factual information and not go beyond um, 
that into any editorializing. Yeah, that that would be the the duty of staff, and so I I do think it's possible that when attempting to analyze some of these um, questions and subjects proposed by Ms. Grove, it, it is possible that the response will be it is not uh, possible to to analyze those questions, and staff and or consultants that are utilized will. Um, make those conclusions if necessary in order to create an unbiased factual report. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember, Councilmember Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, just to, to follow up as far as the work that will be done um, for this report, um, considering that our um, housing department, I, I believe that's on our uh, next item on our agenda um, to discuss um, staffing for that. But how, how is this report going to be done um, within the 30 day period? Are we using our existing um, housing element consultant? Are we, or is it only staff or is it a combination um, that will share the workload? And this is a question for our city manager. Uh, let, let's see, so the approach that we're <coughs> pursuing is uh, trying to tap um, consultant resources uh, as much as we can. Um, we are going to, in terms of overall, um, the, the subject matter, matter level of expertise, um, if, if our current housing element consultant has the capacity, that would be um, most likely our, our, our first step. Um, if they have limited capacity, we, we will may be forced to explore other other options. There's the there will most likely be a team of consultants. There's subject matters about uh, fiscal impacts, transportation impacts, so it's most likely going to involve multiple consultants. Uh, and then there will be a need for um, staff involvement as well, and uh, city city attorney too. So it's it the production of the report will be a, a team approach. From a staff perspective, we're looking to have as much consultant assistance as possible, though. And and there, I have a couple of follow-up questions, Mr. Murphy, and that's just with the reporting. Um, the will the once the report is completed, uh, will that go to you first? Um, does it come to the council first? It, it would. Um, I mean, it, it's reviewed by staff, and when it's ready, uh, then it would come to the city council. Thank you. And I actually have one other question, just the, the cost um, of the, the consulting. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that the, the cost would increase if we had to use multiple consultants and our existing um, housing element um, consultant would not be able to fulfill this task. Uh, let's see. So in terms of the cost, I believe that it's going to be a um, potential for a multi-step process um, to be able to initiate work with consultants. Uh, we're going to be looking for a, a contract that would be within the uh, city manager's um, spending authority, and some of that will be discussed as part of the future agenda item this evening about the uh, budget. And so there's two parts. One is um, the contract amount. Right now that's at uh, $80,000 maximum. The, with the next budget item, there's the potential to increase it to $86,000 for this upcoming fiscal year. Second thing is the budget. Right now there's no um, money allocated in next year's budget for this report, but the council does have the opportunity to do so with the future agenda item. So we would um, initiate work um, within the $86,000 potentially maximum. There may be a need to come back for a contract amendment at a future meeting. That would be the July 7th meeting, I just sorry, July 12th meeting. So um, that's a multi-step process to comply with contracting and budgeting uh, requirements of the city. In terms of which which consultant we use, um, 
um, consultants these days are in, in high demand with limited availability. Um, again, our, our greatest um, opportunity for efficiency would be to tap our existing prime consultant, which is M Group, and then some of their sub consultants for fiscal impacts, uh, transportation impacts. So if we can um, get some additional capacity from those consultants, that'd be the most efficient uh, way to pursue this work, I believe. Thank you. And I wanted to follow up Mayor Nash, um, just to, to make sure that um, the question that I asked was included um, in the request. And then when a motion is made, will we need to read all of these items to include it? I, I think um, my, what I have heard is that the council would like to have the items um, which are set forth in Ms. Grove's email of today to the extent that it is possible to address those. And council member Taylor, um, I believe that your request is, um, would be additive to um, Ms. Groves, that the, that the report also study the impacts on um, other sites in, uh, in the housing element. Is, is that accurate? Yes, thank you. So yes, I think if the council can make a motion just restating those, um, those items, that would be helpful. Council Member Combs. Yeah, I just want to go back and again, want to make clear, I, I am supportive for the suggestions offered by Ms. Grove based on the stipulation that as staff comes to those um, questions or topics where it feels that it cannot provide um, a clear and biased statement, then um, then, then it, it will it will it will um, not attempt to answer answer that. And I also say in in issues of where it comes to a topic or issue that is seems complex and, and based on a lot of different variables. For one, she talks about the budget impacts on on the Ravenswood City School District. There are a thousand different budget decisions that go into a, a public organization's uh, you know budgeting. And, and I don't think that we could in good conscience um, isolate out the, the impacts on this from anything else. And so, um, but with the, those caveats, with the idea that the staff knows that they have the agency to not answer those things that it does not feel it can answer within, um, um, against the spirit of, of this report, then, then I'm, I'm comfortable with it. And uh, I am comfortable with uh, uh, Council Member Taylor's uh, efforts to uh, or, or request us see the, the impacts on on other um, uh, on other sites. I mean, I would hope to, to some degree that that's generally part of just the report, right? That we're going to see, like, because um, I know obviously a lot of talk has been on. Um, specifically the flood school site and the impacts there. But, but of course, this is a citywide, um, uh, this would be a citywide change and impact all low density zoning, which is, I don't know, someone will tell me what percentage, but it is a vast percentage of, of the city uh, falls within this, this zoning. And so thereby um, would be impacted by this. And so, um, and, and so yeah, all that being said, I, I'll, I will make a motion um, uh, uh, again, uh, 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 you know, calling for the report as, as stipulated and, and outlined in the staff report um, with the provisions asked for in the CCIN email from Karen Grove and with the, in making sure to highlight the additional um, um, impacts that, that Council Member Taylor ha, has, has requested. I will second that and just state that I absolutely agree with you. And I think that it's imperative that this is as compl considered completely unbiased, that this is very factual. Thank you. Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you. So um, I'm very much in favor of doing the report and I support the suggestions that have been made thus far. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the impact of this initiative on our ability to deliver affordable housing. Um, and so I know the immediate consequence of the flood school site 
but a particular emphasis on um, other public or nonprofit institutions that have sites that do not currently have any single family homes, but that are zoned this residential density. Um, I'd like to understand the impact, not just for this housing element cycle, but um, which sites this would impact. Um, I'm also concerned about the fire district, um, who I believe station one is a um, residential zoning, who's planning on remodeling and rebuilding on Middlefield Road and um, what the impact would be on having to go to voter approval. And, um, and I'm, I'm hoping these impacts also, um, both for the housing impacts and for the, the institutional impacts um, showed like the timing. Um, and I know that we're working really hard on council and in the housing element to make it easier for people to build affordable housing and how, in what ways may this um, make it harder and less feasible? Um, of course, in an unbiased, um, objective way. Um, and then I have a question then for City Attorney Doherty or possibly for City Manager Murphy. Um, I know there's been some discussion as we heard tonight from our public commenters about the council's position on this initiative. Is it appropriate at this time for the council to discuss the possibility of taking a position as a legislative body on this measure to um, eliminate confusion on the part of our community on where we stand on this. Yes, so the, the city council as a whole, as well as individual council members may take a position on the measure. Um, that position can be taken during a public meeting or um, outside of a public meeting. The limitation on those free speech rights is that they, uh, the individual council members and the council as a whole do not utilize public resources in taking a position or furthering that position. Um, but the answer to your question is yes, it would be appropriate to discuss your position and or discuss uh, the council taking a position. Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. And, and thank you, Vice Mayor Willison for, for bringing that um, topic up as far as the individual position of the council and the council as a whole. Is that something we need to discuss before we take a vote on the, on the item? I don't know if that's a no. question. Okay. No, the council could move forward with a motion on the table and uh, not end this agenda item. Okay. Thank you. So I would actually say that I would like council member Mueller to be here when we do um, make this decision, because I think um, this is one of those times when it's an important to have the full council available. And, and um, if I can offer, council member Combs already mentioned this, but when the report returns and it must come back within 30 days, then the council will again be presented with the two options of adopting the measure itself or uh, placing the measure on the ballot. And so the materials that are before you tonight will come back again in within 30 days along with the report. There will be no action on the report. Um, it's just a receive and file. Certainly the council may ask questions about it, um, but there would be no like revising of the report. Um, but at that same meeting, the council will then have those two options. And that would be another opportunity to discuss a position on the measure. Additionally, the council can direct staff to place an agenda item on a council a meeting agenda to discuss it at a later time as well. Thank you, Council Member Combs. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure I understand. You, you're talking about you want the full council present, um, not on the action before us about whether to ask for the report, but with regards to whether the council is going to take a, a position on, on it. Precisely. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Just, yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you for that 
uh, clarification. I'm um, comfortable waiting for Council Member Mueller to discuss what action to take or not take as a legislative body on whether to um, oppose or endorse or stay neutral on this uh, measure as, as a legislative body. Um, for myself personally, Ms. Doria, I am allowed to um, state a position. You are. Okay. Um, I am eager to hear the results of the report in terms of unintended consequences that may not have been fully um, considered by myself and others. Um, however, given the known impact to the flood school site, I am opposed to this ballot measure and I wanted my position to be known so that the public has that information. Thank you. Thank you. City Clerk Karen, um, could you please uh, state the motion and call for a vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, so I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Combs and a second by Mayor Nash to order a report pursuant to election code section 9212 and to include the following in the report, racial and economic equity, educational equity, ability to comply with state housing laws, climate and traffic impacts, and impacts to the existing sites included in the draft housing element. Is there any further city council question discussion? Did I capture all of the additional inclusions? Um, Mr. Um, Mayor Willison. Uh, just a point of clarification on the traffic impacts. We yeah. have in our city both level of service and vehicle miles traveled. And so I believe Ms. Grove's point had to do more with um, vehicle miles traveled. Um, I know I bring this up all the time, but um, I just wanted to put that out there. And then I didn't know if the impacts that I had mentioned, particularly around public nonprofit institutions, um, such as the fire district, schools, churches, um, not just for this housing element and not just for housing, um, but those sites that are not currently with single family homes, um, but that would be affected by this um, zoning ordinance if those would also be included in the impact analysis. And I guess I would just say that um, my understanding from the items number one through seven um, that are listed in the report and required are part of this um, regular report that um, would actually cover the, um, Sorry, I'm looking. Um, the ability of the city to meet its regional housing needs and the availability and location of housing, as well as, um, again, is um, the ability to comply with state housing laws and climate and traffic impacts. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm happy to include those, um, but I'm assuming that that's part of the uh, report in any case. Thank you. And so is there consensus um, around the city council for me to add VMT to climate and traffic impacts? Or are we keeping- um, Yeah, I don't think it's, they're gonna do a technical analysis on okay. vehicle miles traveled. I just, um, when we say traffic and transportation, it can mean a lot of things. And I just wanted to endorse Ms. Grove's kind of definition of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Taylor? Yes. Vice mayor Woolison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Mueller absent. Thank you. We now move on to regular business. Under regular business, that actually, um, do we know whether council member Mueller is, a, he is not available yet. So um, given that, let's move on to the next regular business item, which would be uh, G2. G2 is direction on the Burgess Pool Aquatics Operator Agreement negotiation. 
to introduce the item is Library and Community Services Director Sean Reinhart. Good evening, Mayor and Council members of the public. Uh, yes, my name is Sean Reinhart, the Director of Library and Community Services, here to provide a brief summary of the staff report that was included in the packet. This item is direction on the Burgess Pool Aquatics Operator Agreement negotiation. Uh, one update since the publication of the agenda packet for tonight's meeting, that packet went out um, last Friday, is that Team Sheeper gave the city written notification that they have withdrawn their request for a management fee. So a management fee was uh, listed in the report as one of the requested terms. However, uh, Team Sheeper, since the publication of the packet, uh, wrote the city uh, officially withdrawing that request. Um, just to move into the substance of the report, the, uh, the city is engaged in a negotiation with Team Sheeper Inc., the current operator of Burgess Pool. Uh, their current agreement expires on August 31st of this year, unless it is renewed and extended by both parties. Um, there's been some discussion about the terms um, related to the city council's previous um, decision and direction to staff given in February of this year related to what's desired for the future of the aquatics program in Menlo Park. Uh, fast forward to today. In those negotiations, the provider has requested these following four terms here on the screen. Uh, one is to exclude Burgess Pool from the upcoming aquatics request for proposals. The city council in February directed staff to prepare and issue a request for proposals for an operator for the Burgess Pool, as well as the new Menlo Park Community Campus Pool now under construction at 100 Terminal Avenue in the Belhaven neighborhood. So the provider is requesting in the terms of the upcoming agreement to actually exclude the Burgess Pool from that RFP. The providers also requesting a minimum five-year agreement at Burgess Pool uh, commencing on August 31st, uh, again, for five years. Uh, providers also requesting that the city compensate the provider for any lost revenue that result from extended pool closures that may be caused by maintenance and repair delays. Um, under the current agreement, the city is responsible for maintaining the Burgess Pool facility. And then um, the last of the requested terms is to eliminate revenue share from the agreement. The current agreement um, entails um, some sharing of revenue that the tool generates above a certain kind of base amount. If uh, revenue exceeds that base amount, then a portion of that revenue is then um, sent to the city. Uh, so just in summary, again, from the report, there are some key considerations and direction that staff is seeking from city council tonight related to the negotiation. And uh, they reflect those four questions on the screen. Should the city focus the request for proposals on the new MPCC pool only, or should the Burgess pool remain in the RFP so that RFP would be both pools? Should the city extend providers agreement at Burgess pool past August 31st? Should the city elect not to negotiate or renew provider's agreement and begin a search for a new operator at purchase pool? And should the city change the revenue share? Next steps in the aquatics program, uh, previously reported to council in February, um, staff is preparing an analysis and a city council study session about the future aquatics operations. That's tentatively calendared for August 9th. And it's tentatively to be followed by issuance of the request for proposals for the new MPCC pool in late September of this year. Uh, that concludes uh, the presentation. I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm sorry. Are you? Um, are we going to hear from Mr. Sheeper now, or you're waiting? You're wondering if there's any questions now. I believe Mr. Sheeper is uh, potentially here. I'd look to the city clerk to see if he's available to um, speak to the city council. I do know that Mr. Sheeper sent in some extensive written comments to the city.council at memopoc.org email address earlier this afternoon. 
So I would look to the city clerk to see if Mr. Schieffer is available. Um, and in the meantime, if there are any clarifying questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I would like to um, add that I know that the email came in at about 515 and I certainly um, did not have a chance to read it after anything that comes in after an hour before the meeting is, I don't, I generally don't have time to get to. So if there's anything that, um, if Mr. Sheeper is not there, if you could possibly go through the items on his, in his email, that would be helpful if that's appropriate. So Absolutely. if I could just put a quick call out to our attendees, I'm not seeing uh, Tim Sheeper in the list, but uh, Tim, if maybe you're there calling in or you have a, a different attendee name, if you could maybe double click your raised hand, just so I can flag you as, um, as in the audience and promote you. Then I do not see that. So I don't believe we have uh, Tim with us at this time. So uh, uh, through the mayor, if I may, uh, if Mr. Sheeper's not available, I'm happy to summarize the email that he sent to council um, this afternoon. Mr. Reinhardt, um, I'm just wondering if we should take a break for a moment and try and contact Mr. Sheeper, perhaps because we took the budget out of order or we took this prior to the budget waiting for Mr. Uh, council Member Mueller. Um, I'm wondering whether we can possibly contact Mr. Sheeper and make sure he has an opportunity to speak if he would like to. Absolutely, that. we can certainly okay. do that. Okay, let's take a five minute break right now um, to as well as reconvene at 7.50 and see if um, we can contact him. Thank you.
having a quorum of our city council uh, back on our virtual and in-person dais. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you very much. Um, Library and Community Services Director, Sean Reinhart, please. Oh, yes, thank you, Mayor. So I, I was able to contact Mr. Sheeper by phone during the recess. Um, he is not available to make a comment at this time. He did indicate that he had sent his written comments in earlier and he doesn't have anything to add to them at this time. Um, if the city council members maybe had an opportunity to read it during the recess, but if not, um, he, he did say he was okay with either the city clerk or myself reading those comments out um, during the proceedings here. So at your pleasure, Madam Mayor. I think council members had an opportunity to read it during um, the recess. I don't know that community members did, but um, it is available online um, in the CCIN log for anyone who is interested in seeing those uh, comments. Um, so I guess let's, um, yeah. Um, so let's continue um, with city clerk, um, Judy Heron, please call for public comments on this item. Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item G2, direction on the Burgess Pool Aquatics Operator Agreement Negotiation, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of the screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. And for any participants in the chambers, feel free to step up to the podium. And our first speaker will be Lindsay Rake, followed by Cameron. Good evening, um, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Yeah, my name is Lindsay Reich and I'm the CEO of Warm Water Wellness, um, a newly formed nonprofit. We're a 501c3 nonprofit um, that what, we're a group of advocates. Actually, um, this, my particular, um, my particular group was created at, in response to the closure of the Nicholson therapy pool at Mills Health Center in San Mateo. And um, we are, uh, I have been receiving quite a few emails from our advocacy group members regarding the Burgess Pool and concerns about discriminatory pricing and access. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, 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 I fear that the same thing that's hap that happened with the Mickelson Pool is happening at Burgess, where COVID is being used as an excuse. Um, this is what this is what's happening on a bigger scale with Sutter, where they closed. Um, where they were closing programs prior to the, the shelter in place county directive and then closed the Mickelson pool um, in March of 2020 and then never reopened it and, um, and did not uh, continue the community programs. And so I see this happening at Burgess where there's been a reduction of access um, to the disabled and the elderly. I'm also here tonight to speak to you as a former patron of the Burgess Pool. I used that pool all last summer um, because there are no warm water therapy alternatives in the area. It's not ideal, it's a lap pool. I understand it's not designed as a therapeutic pool, but it is a warm water pool and many Mickelson refugees use this facility. Um, you know, and we're, we, we used it and, and as we patiently are waiting to hopefully get the Mickelson therapy pool reopened at some point. Um, I actually reached out to council member uh, Drew Holmes, who was the, the mayor at the time, and, and um, he was amazing, so helpful. Um, I, I have a chronic pain condition. My partner has a spinal cord injury. And I, my personal experience was that it was extremely difficult to get the staff to, um, to offer equitable alternatives. Um, I was just trying to get some simple solutions like being able to park in, a, in, the, in the back so that I could enter and have fewer steps to walk, trying to have a chair near the pool so there was somewhere to sit because the benches were frequently, they were closed for a good part of the summer due to with wet paint signs posted up above. Um, it was incredibly difficult to get the leadership there to listen to me and it was, an, it was only 
through the wonderful help of um, Mayor, again, at the time, Mayor Combs, that I was able to get them to um, hear the needs of the disability community. So please consider this when you are, um, you know, when you are thinking about renewing his, Tim Sheeper's contract. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Tom Pressing, followed by Janet Davis. Good evening, uh, Mayor Nash and Council. Thank you. I'm Tom Pressing. I lived at 194 Ravenswood Avenue since October 1977. Real quickly, as a 25-year emergency uh, citizen responder, I'm pleased that you've moved forward with the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator for our city. Uh, it's long overdue, so thank you. Uh, I retired from Stanford in 2015 after 41 years in facility engineering and management and as a certified OSHA safety inspector during the last nine years of my tenure um, at the university. I swim daily at Burgess and realize how blessed we are in Menlo Park to have such a facility available to, to us and funded by taxpayers. From a facilities point of view and a safety inspector point of view, I'd like to have the council consider these points of perspective as you determine the next contract iteration for a Burgess pool operator. In part to the pool operator, that's, the pool is a community facility paid for by mental park citizens and is not a personal property for profit only considerations. In part to the future operator, that they are the steward of a community pool that is available for all residents in Menlo Park, including those who live east of 101, especially now that the Bill Haven pool is been renovated. Use best practices, which for facilities is a three year contract with a yearly review to keep the the council and citizens informed with patron input available. Ensure a safe, safe pool environment by providing in-service training for all lifeguards to review best practices, review pool issues and rules, review schedule, practice in-water techniques, and most importantly, discuss recent activity to improve, recent rescue activity to improve um, lifeguard and community safety. The current lifeguard cad cadre is strong and needs to stay that way. Enforce and post rules for the pool, provide clear and concise signage, adhere to both Cal OSHA and Red Cross pool operations guides, maintain adequate staffing, uh, provide access to open swim via the graduated steps for um, pregnant women, the elderly, children, um, um, and those who need that access. Schedule lanes for all community. The current uh, outline is optimal. Pool inspections should be tele not telegraphed in advance or prearranged so that the pool safety and operational effectiveness can be clearly determined. Prioritize the Bellhaven project for our citizens on the other side of 101. We owe it to the entire Menlo Park community to provide the best for the most at an affordable monetary rate equitable for equitable Burgess Pool participation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Janet Davis, and this will be the final call for public comment. And you can speak right after Janet for our in-person. So final call for public comment on item G2. So Janet Davis. Thank you. Can, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I just think that the RFP should be directed to Burgess as well as the, uh, the Bellhaven pool. There's been an undue emphasis on the athletic component of Team Sheepa to the exclusion of some of the rest of the residents of Menlo Park, especially the elderly and the disabled. And the uh, wellness classes have been discontinued and a lot of people who would like to use the pool cannot at the moment. And I just would hope that you would have a better system for overseeing his contract 
and his responsiveness. That has not been happening. And I also want to make sure that when the Bellhaven pool opens, it is available to everybody in the community, not just the athletes of Tim Sheeper's organization. There has been a, a, a discriminatory effect in the pool in that the master's program and the people who belong to Team Sheepa pay a very little amount of money for an enormous amount of pool time, whereas the elderly have to pay a lot more for less time. And I hope you would address that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our next speaker is stepping up to the podium. If you can just state your name for the record. Thank my, you. <clears throat> my name is Eric Cunin. I am the treasurer for Solo Swim Club, which is a subleaser of the Burgess Pool Space from Team Sheeper. Uh, I come here having been uh, associated with the Burgess program and uh, Solo since before the pool was built. And so I feel somewhat uh, uh, informed on, on the nature of the discussions and I've met with Tim many times. I think that in terms of marketing, my, my background is in engineering and marketing. And I think that uh, with respect to the item having to do with splitting, the MPCC from the Burgess Pool actually has some merit because the two markets are somewhat different. They serve different clientele. They could be, and an operator working on the MPCC, if I may just uh, venture an opinion, would be able to serve that market more focused and better offering programming and opportunity and access uh, than an operator who has to work on both, which serves a different set of clientele or over, over a larger geography. Most people, I live in the Sharon Park area, so I would go to a swim a pool at, uh, at Burgess. It'd be difficult for me to drive all the way across town to go to an MPCC pool. I think the same thing would exist for those who in the Bellhaven area who would find it difficult to drive down Willow Road to get to the uh, Burgess pool. They would want to work with a pool that accommodates their needs at MPCC. And therefore, I think that an operator focused on their needs uh, in that, for that community might optimize for, those, for their needs, offer programming, times, access that meets the rhythms of their lives, which are different perhaps than the rhythm of somebody on the west side. Um, as, as a personal matter, I find Tim Sheeper to be an excellent businessman. I think he does a diff, uh, has a difficult job of balancing uh, many different competing priorities, including the needs of my own organization. Uh, and I can't fault him for some of the decisions he's made. Uh, I think that, uh, as I say, he's been an able uh, business operator, uh, but I do think that there are some other ways in which the contract might be restructured to hold uh, an, any operator more accountable for the uh, maintenance and uh, also the revenue that's being generated by that asset. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. So our final speaker will be Lynn Bramlett. Good evening again, Council. To me, the central issue is, does the existing contract benefit the residents of Menlo Park enough? It's a community pool. Are the residents of Menlo Park getting sufficient benefit from the Burgess Park community pool? If not, I think the contract should be re-examined. I do not swim in the pool. However, I have heard many concerns from neighbors and also read concerns from others I don't know regarding the current contract. I also know someone who teaches swimming with the current provider and this person really values the program. To me, the current pool contractor should be more flexible regarding the concerns that residents have expressed. To me, there should be a middle ground where he is open to cutting back his swim school hours so that residents can have more access to the pool. To me, the idea of removing the Burgess pool from the upcoming RFP seems too inflexible a stance. I do not agree, agree with that. As to the staff report, and I'll touch on that in a moment in more detail. As to the staff report, I thought it needed more information in two key areas. The first is more detail regarding the current provider's expenses so we can evaluate these better. For example, the staff report stated that in 2021, the current provider reported total income of 2.102 million 
which was offset by expenses of 1.830 million. That represented a net income of 272 and $80. So, um, but without the listing of the expenses, one can't really evaluate that. Um, the, the, in 2019, the provider got less net income. And I remember reading about a reluctance to kind of meet the needs of the, you know, it wasn't as profitable out in working in the Bellhaven community pool. So splitting the contract could lead to not having somebody who wanted to serve both, for example. Finally, I wanted to know if the residents are still paying on the bond measure that paid for the pool, Burgess pool. Uh, in multiple years past, it was in the financial documents and I didn't have time to review them. But if we are still paying off on that bond measure, I think that should have been included as another you know, in the category of expenses that the residents pay to operate that pool. So I, I do ask the council very respectfully if you could find out if we are still paying on that bond measure. And thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. We have one more hand go up. So our next speaker is Julie Shanson. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> uh, thank you for having me. I'm calling to say that I am concerned that this particular operator does not um, have the most accessible programming and that I would like to see um, us consider either bringing the operation of the pool back in house or requiring um, some demonstrated effort on behalf of the populace. I think that our pool serves the people who use it, but not the people who could use it or would use it. And that is specifically families, um, both in the Bellhaven neighborhood and all over the city who uh, would be in need of um, the ability to pay less than the market rate uh, to use the pool. I think that it is off-putting and difficult um, for residents to uh, figure out how and when and also to pay. Um, specifically during COVID, this was a problem with reservations and even now that COVID is over, I think it continues to be a problem that uh, more outreach needs to be done and that more programming needs to be accessible both financially and uh, for the needs of all residents of Menlo Park. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you very much. And um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that um, Council Member Mueller has just joined us, and I believe that um, he is recusing himself from the item. So, do you want to, um, Council Member Mueller, uh, is that correct? And could you give us the, um, I believe, the reason why? Um, Mayor Nash, I believe that he uh, signed into the meeting, but he is still not present as he knows he's recused from it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Of That's course. great. Excellent. All right. Um, okay, let's open for city council discussion then. Is there someone who would like to um, lead on this? Council Member Combs. Yeah, thanks. Can, would it be possible to put up that slide with the um, uh, terms as desired by, by Mr. Sheeper? <laughs> so I, I did wanna follow up on at least one item from public comment um, mentioned by Ms. Bramlett, who was basing her comment in part on, on um, <clears throat> figures. <clears throat> in the staff report, and, and that is, I think it was for 2021, there was a 
profit or expenses uh, subtracted from an income of two hundred and seventy two thousand um, dollars. Do we? So two questions. One is the entity or the vendor, as far as we know it, is that like a you know sole proprietorship or LLC where Mr. Sheeper is the exclusive owner? Do, do we know that for certain, or, or is, is there some other sort of ownership arrangement in connection with this entity? Uh, Council Member Combs, thank you for that question. Uh, I don't believe staff has that level of detail regarding the ownership of the organization. We do know that it's, it's formed as an, it's incorporated. The uh, name is Team Sheeper Inc. Uh, not sure if it's structured as an LLC or some other form of corporation. Staff can certainly find out. Also, we do know that Mr. Sheeper is the president and CEO, but whether there are other ownership interests, um, we don't have that information at this time, but we can investigate. Okay, truly fair. And then one other question, which you may not have the answer to either, but, but certainly want to put it out there um, in the public space. Do we know if Mr. Sheeper pays himself a salary? So essentially to Ms. Bramlett's earlier point of we don't know what expenses are. Like do, do we at least know, do, do we know um, if in those expenses there is a, a salary for, for, for him? We do know in the financials that are provided as part of the agreement that salaries are paid, but it does not list individual salaries of people who receive okay. them, so we don't know that. Okay, thanks, whether, whether he pays himself a salary. Um, totally fair, Th thanks for those, the, those, those answers, Mr. Reinhardt. And, and of course, th this information came um, in connection with the uh, initial request for um, an operating fee uh, to be paid by the city to, uh, to, to Mr. Sheeper of $10,000 a month, which um, as you noted er earlier has, has since been, been rescinded. But, um, Again, since, since the operating fee was was asked for, and and it, it brought up these um these financial uh, um, you know the, the financial aspects, I, I thought it was important to explore. Um, I do think it's important that we you know frame and understand that like, is it is it your understanding, Mr. Reinhardt, that that the council is to um, acquiesce to these terms, and then that becomes our a, another sort of a counter offer, or is it your understanding that um, you know uh, again? If the, the yeah, so so my question is is does a count, is this a scenario where the council is providing a counter offer, or it either acquiesces to the terms, uh, or there is no no moving forward. Uh, and just, just, just are, are we in a negotiation or is this sort of a final demand? And, and that's the only thing that, that the, the Sheeper organization is expecting to hear from the council on. That is a good question. Um, I think I would look to the city attorney to discuss like the, to characterize kind of the, the you know, the, the current state of affairs. And I think, you know, the, the goal here would be to continue discussions in the negotiation, but they've arrived at a point with these terms that staff felt that some city council direction was um, you know, appropriate and needed at this point uh, to ensure that you know, we're representing what the city council and the city's interests are. Um, the one of these four terms that uh, the Sheeple organization kind of put forward as being like really kind of a, a firm request on their part was to, is to exclude Burgess Pool from the aquatics RFP. Um, the other is they didn't quite have that same level of, of um, deal breaker, if you will. As that I, I didn't. I don't know if I if I if I heard you. What was the one request that was was most important to them? Uh, related to the request for proposals, uh, they are requesting that the Burgess Pool not be part of the upcoming request for proposals. That the request okay. for proposals so, so, only so, focus on the MPCC pool. So, so then, so then we can sort of say we'll exclude the Burgess pool, um, and then though, like say, hey, we will because the initial just to be clear, this is a response into our our essentially offer to 
renew the contract at its current terms for one more year or until um, we were going to sort of, uh, you know, want an operator to to make a bid on re response to an RFP in, in terms of running both pools, the new MPCC pool and, and the Burgess pool, right? And so th their response was this, right? And so then it, I'm just saying like, if we take Burgess out of that RFP, um, but then we say we only want to renew the contract for a year because uh, we want to do Burgess and, and the MPCC at the same time as separate RFPs, <laughs> like with that, with that, would that go to, I feel like we'd be in the same boat, right? And so it, it seems as though they're, they're kind of combined. And again, I know, no, Mr. Sheeper is not here and I'm not asking for you necessarily, although I am a little bit, um, to, to, to take a position, but it seems as though it's, it's like, he wants the five years and he doesn't want Burgess to be as part of this, this RFP, right? That they're, they're, they're sort of linked. They are, um, you know, I think where there may be some room for discussion is, is the number of years. Um, if, if the council were to uh, say, okay, we are okay with removing the Burgess pool from the RFP, then the conversation really kind of becomes about, well, wh what does continuing services at Burgess pool look like currently? Um, you know, the requested term from Schieffer is, is five years, but there, there could be some room for discussion on that length of time. Um, but, but really that's subject to further, further discussion. We don't know, I wouldn't presume to, to speak for, for Team Schieffer. And can you remind me what's been the standard length of the con of our contract with, with Schieffer, like prior to this current sort of renewal negotiation? Yeah, it, it, it has varied in, in, in length. Uh, anywhere like three years is pretty standard. Um, lately, it's been it's kind of reverted to a year to year renewal. Um, uh, part of that is the pandemic sort of um, you know necessitated just kind of making it work and just letting it renew. And there were some other things to focus on, but the uh, pending NPCC pool and the RFP I think really kind of forced the question about well what does the the future of, of the aquatics operation look like. And then my, my final question, I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues, um, is, is that this current contract ends on August 31st, correct? Yes. And, and so what are, because if we're going back and forth, like obviously the council has to meet in public session <laughs> to, um, to then like, if we offer something and then he counter offers and like, that can take some time um, and we're gonna be in July soon. So ha has it ever we be, ever been in a scenario where we have been negotiating past the end of a contract? And, and is there some sort of uh, provisions in that regard or do we have some clarity from Mr. Sheeper where he stands regarding the, the current end of the contract on August 31st? I, I, my, um understanding in, in other negotiations of this nature is that if, if negotiations are, are like if discussions are happening and they're making progress that um, you know there, there could be some desire on the part of both parties to sort of continue on the current terms until those discussions kind of you know bear fruit. So I think I would look to the city attorney about you know is there a particular legal instrument needed there? Um, but, you know, like one example would be a labor MOU, uh, for example, you know, sometimes they will expire and there won't be a new contract, but the existing terms kind of continue on until the new one is, is implemented. But, you know, that depends on the good faith of both parties to kind of agree that, you know, they're going to continue under the current terms until they uh, set the new agreement. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll save my, my, my comments until... Um... Uh, others have asked their questions. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Thank you. Thank you. Is someone else interested in picking this up at this point or? <laughs> so, all right, I will um, 
first of all, confess that I am a regular user of the pool <laughs> and um, I am absolutely do not want to see the pool go down for any reason. I think it's not, um, it would just be travesty for everyone. Um, I'm very disappointed that we are in this state right now where we have reached this impasse. Um, I think that um, I, I think for um, Mr. Sheeper essentially to be threatening to take his ball and go home when it's in fact the city's pool is what we're talking about is a very um, challenging place to be. Looking at the provider's terms, I think that um, it would be, I, I do not wanna see Burgess and the MPCC pools separated. I believe that um, it is something where we need to have an RFP where we look at how can we align the two pools, um, both from um, affordability, access, service levels, and to separate them ahead of the RFP is does not make sense to me. It may be something that comes up as part of the RFP, but I believe that both pools should be in the RFP. Further, I believe that a five-year agreement at Burgess Pool does not, um, basically that means that we cannot do the RFP. So I am um, having trouble with where we are at this point. Um, further compensate the pro provider for lost revenue um, resulting from extended pool closures. Um, the pool users were given no um, such benefit from the pool closures. And so I am um, challenged to see why the um, provider would be compensated for something when the pool users um, do not receive any such benefit. Um, having said that, I will let other council members um, provide their input. Councilmember Taylor, did you want to? Councilmember Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I wanted to follow up on a, a couple of the questions um, from a public comment. And there, these questions may be answered um, at a later time. Um, and that is just, um, has the um, contractor, Mr. Sheeper, done his own um, survey for folks who use the pool? I know the city has done one. So just trying to find out if he's doing any surveying um, directly with folks that use the, the facility. Thank you for the question, council member. Yes, Mr. Sheeper's organization does do a survey of their users every year. Um, they included that survey result in their annual report to the city, which was included in the um, February 8 report to city council, and that's listed in the attachments of tonight's report. Uh, so again, they did that survey. Now that survey was of the users of, of Team Cheaper's um, services. Okay, um, thank you. The, the next question is, um, this came from public comment about uh, current expenses um, for the pool. I'm, I'm guessing it was not um, a line by line accounting and just a lump sum number. Um, and is it possible to, to have that information? Uh, there is a little bit more detail than just about some number. It doesn't list out like individual salaries, which was a question earlier, but it does have you know, major areas of expenditure and we can provide that information to the council. Thank you. And then my last question was about the bond measure um, and, and if we are still paying on the pool. If, ta if taxpayers are still paying them. Uh, that question might need a little bit more research um, and we'll have to get that information to council um, at a later time, I believe. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Nash, I uh, agree with the, some of the comments that you provided earlier, um, that your concerns that you expressed. Um, I 
two, um, want to see our service provider for both pools and not having two um, separate contractors. Um, I do not know where we go from here. I'm not sure who is in the negotiating room um, on behalf of the city. Um, I'm, my guess is Mr. Sheeper is, is negotiating on behalf of himself. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely not in support of having two different providers. I'm not in support of having a five-year contract. Um, and, um, and those are my comments for now. Thank you. Vice Mayor Willison. Um, thank you, Mayor Nash. And um, I do want to disclose that I called and spoke to Mr. Sheeper um, today. So I had a long conversation with him. Um, and I, um, I thanked him for getting our pool through the pandemic. Um, so I just want to acknowledge uh, what a service he has, has provided. I mean, he's kept a pool running for many, many years in our city. And I know there are a lot of happy swimmers um, at Burgess Pool. Um, that being said, you know, we do get emails from various residents and constituents with concerns um, some who spoke this evening and, and some who haven't. And the themes tend to center around um, family, um, elderly, and, um, and people with disabilities and, and kind of the accessibility. And what's hard for me, and I'm, I'm guessing my council members, is it's hard to know the extent <laughs> of um, how many residents are really satisfied and I know Mr. Sheeper does do community, uh, does do pool user surveys that tend to show that the people that are using the pool are very, very satisfied, which is wonderful. Um, but the gap then is well, who's not using the pool, who would use the pool if there was a different mix and, and availability um, uh, of services and uh, programs offered. And so I do believe we are in the midst right now of a community survey. Um, and maybe once I'm done making my comment, either the city manager or Mr. Reinhardt can let people know where to take that survey, but try just to get at, you know, what, if you're a resident, what would make you go to the pool more? Uh, what programs and services are, are residents looking for? Um, so I was really looking forward. So, so the way I'm thinking about this is that I'm, I really wanna hear from our community. You know, what do we want in a pool? Um, do we want it to be focused on kind of those athletic um, teams or do we want a lot of lap swimming or do we want a lot of wellness programs? Um, is it really important that all the kids in our community learn how to swim? So we should do a lot of uh, swim lessons um, and things like that. And so I was looking forward to getting the survey results. And then I believe we even have a study session to discuss the pool and kind of what the council and the community is thinking we'd like in the pool. Um, later in August, I believe. Um, so seeing this agenda item kind of throws a wrench in our ability to first have that conversation <laughs> um, and then to see how well, you know, how to, how to meet those needs. And another thing that's kind of got my head scratching is when we talk about, you know, what I've been looking a lot at the pool schedule today and how many lanes are dedicated to lap swimming versus lessons versus this team and that team. And it's so hard for me to analyze, um, you know, what this all means. I know this is what Mr. Sheeper does every day. So I appreciate him for trying to strike that balance every day. Um, but what I can't tell is, is the community's ideal, is he already there? Or are we a mile away from there? Or are we you know, an inch away from there? I can't even tell if we're really far apart in our desired outcome and where, how close we are to reaching that or if we're really close. And so um, I feel like we still have to have a lot of conversations <laughs> with Mr. Sheeper and the community to, to figure this out. So I'm very alarmed at this August 31st pool shutting down deadline because I just don't think we have the time to have the quality conversations that we need to have in order to make a really thoughtful decision. And um, I, I see, I want us to be able to get to a win-win here. I don't think anyone wants um, the pool to shut down in August. I think that would be really detrimental to <laughs> everyone in the community and, and likely Mr. Sheeper doesn't wanna pack up and go either. And so I'm just wondering if there, you know, 
a way we can buy more time or continue these conversations or um, even give him another year, like try to extend it that extra year now um, and not go to this five years so we can commit to having a community dialogue and a conversation with Mr. Sheeper, potentially um, getting some council members on a subcommittee to join in these negotiations. Um, but I'm, I'm very concerned about the pool shutting down in August. I'm also concerned that I don't have a great way to evaluate how well the pool is currently meeting our community's needs other than some emails that, that come in and around. Um, so um, I don't know where that leaves me. <laughs> I don't really have clear direction. Although I guess my ideal would be to kind of go back to Mr. Sheeper for staff and the negotiating team to go back to Mr. Sheeper um, and see you know, how firm, um, especially this five-year um, agreement is, um, and that you know, we really want to have, you know, maybe it's about outlining a conversation of how we're going to figure this out, because I think it's been quite nebulous, and we've had many priorities, and we haven't maybe been able to dedicate the time to really uh, work with him. Um, but I, I don't think I want the pool to shut down in August. Um, and then in terms of the RFP, yeah, I'm struggling on that one too. So um, that's, that's where I am on this. I'm struggling on many levels. Council member comes. Thank you. Um, Mayor Nash, and, but just, just so I'm understanding, <clears throat> we offered Mr. Sheep for a year, right? And, and this is what he came back with. So, um, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So I, I don't think that like um, going back to him and essentially it was gonna be a year plus, right? It was dependent in to some degree on the, the construction schedule uh, regarding the MPCC. So what I, again, where I land on this is, is that I would, um, um, I would acquiesce. Um, I would say, okay, let's exclude Burgess from the, the future RFP and I'll come back to that in a second. I think five years is a long time for a contract and, and given that there is not a, as Mr. Reinhardt stipulated, a tradition of five-year contracts with Mr. Sheeper, um, I, I do think it's a lot. Um, I do appreciate that sort of staff and other planning is more challenging these days because of the pandemic and, and there is certain assurances that come um, with a longer, a longer commitment. Um, but I would, I, I think again, I would be interested in something closer to two years, excuse me, three years, especially since I am sort of, like I say, acquiescing on, on removing uh, um, the Burgess report from the RFPC, R, RF, RFP. Um, compensate provider and loss of revenue. As I understand it, and someone correct me as I'm wrong, this is in scenarios where the city is deemed sort of to be at fault or have some sort of of responsibility or liability in connection with like the maintenance and repairs, right, and delays. It's not just like there is maintenance and repair delays, right? Is there some other element of which the city has some fault, right? Because given like supply chains of this day and age, I would not um, want to um, commit in a contract to covering revenue for, uh, for maintenance and repair delays, like, right? I mean, there, could be some part that needs to come from um, some, some, some place of which we, we have no control over. So, so I would not be um, necessarily in favor of, of that provision. And then eliminate revenue share from the agreement. Th this to date doesn't produce really much money for the city, correct? Uh, um, and so I, I would, as I understand it, and so I would be comfortable with, with giving in on that, um, on, on that, that measure. Going back to, to my thinking on, and, and I initially started off with this idea that that it didn't make much sense for um, for the city to have like two pool operators. Um, and again, you so that means you couldn't even like sort of schedule. There would be different sort of scheduling platforms and different rules and different, different everything, and it just seemed like it would be um, a, a bit of a, a of a mess. But I do think we have to realize the scenario we're in is is that. Um, the current contract ends on on August 31st, and and we do not have, as a city, the ability to step in on July 1st and run the city, and we don't have 
a, a vendor in the wings who's willing to step in and run the city. So that means that there are some, if this contract is, is not extended, or if Mr. Sheeper decides on the 31st that he's, he's done, then, then that means that the pool closes for some indeterminate period of time. And, and I do think that that's the situation we're in and we, we have to prioritize uh, uh, preventing that. And, and so what I would say was that I would be willing to live with a, a scenario in which, again, we give Mr. Sheeper a three-year contract and then at some point we go off with an RFP regarding the MPCC pool. But I know, and, and someone on staff correct me if I'm wrong, an element of that RFP was going to also be the city scoping out and detailing how the city would run the pool um, and what would be entailed in that. And so that's honestly something of which I would want to lean into, um, a scenario in which what does it look like for the city to run uh, the MPCC pool? Um, and, and because then I think that there has been this long-term debate in the community about what's the benefit or the, the cost versus the benefits of having a vendor um, like Mr. Sheeper run the pool. Um, the idea of if in the future, the city is leaning into it running the MP, MPCC pool itself, I think we begin to be able to see that contrast um, of what that looks like. And again, I, to the public comment, I appreciate there are different <laughs> clientele. And so, um, and, and so it, it's not the same thing but then we get to see the city exercising that muscle. Like right now, we don't even have the ability <laughs> to step in and run the pool. Um, but if we start and if we lean into like uh, how it looks for us to run MPCC and we run it for a couple of years, then when this RFP, when this, when our contract with with uh, with with Mr. Sheeper is back up, then we can, or as it's it's nearing in, then we get to start making decisions um, from a position of some some power. Um, because in, in theory, either we've run the pool for a while and been successful at it, or we've run it <laughs> and not been, and, and we, we, we really sort of know the hands and the cars that we're dealing with. Um, but that's how I would try to sort of like, um, get a win out of what I think is a difficult situation, um, is, and, and that is like, again, I want to see, um, I would, again, I, I know we will go off for the RFP, but as I'm sitting here now, my preference would be that that the city would run the MPCC um, um, and, that, and that we would see how that looks, right? And then, and then we would have the ability um, to, to at some future date, like, um, you, you know, possibly taking over running the Burgess pool. One thing that I think um, we should recognize is while it would, not be a good situation for the city to be, for Burgess to close down on August 31st. Mr. Sheeper also has many contracts and many reasons that he wants the pool to continue beyond August 31st as well. So I, I guess I don't see us as being quite as much at the mercy of Mr. Sheeper. Um, I think that um, we do need to, I would like to see us um, take some harder positions and ask him to come back to the, to the um, negotiating table because I don't think um, that he holds all the cards. And I will, con I do think it's interesting to think about the city running the pool, I would like to look at different options. Um, one of the issues that I see with um, having an outside uh, provider such as Mr. Sheeper running the pool is especially with, um, well, essentially his incentive is the revenue and every additional organized sport team he gets, every additional um, class he puts in the pool, he is gaining revenue as opposed to the city who really would be looking at what is the experience of the residents 
what are the what are the pool users experience i'm not saying that mr sheeper doesn't look at that at all i'm just saying that there's a very different calculation in having a provider that is um looking at the pool as a revenue source and having the city that looks at the pool as a service to residents. Um, one of the things that we um, see with the pool provider as um, adding all the athletic teams is hours before work, before school, and hours after work, after school are heavily, heavily um, used by the athletic teams. And um, so there's very little access for um, residents. Now, definitely there are residents on, on, I assume all of the teams so that we are getting, um, so there are also, there's many competing um, priorities here, but I guess I would like to see us um, ask for Mr. Sheeper to, I, I, I would like to see the council come in and say, no, this is, you know, this is not acceptable the way it is and ask him to come back to the table and see what we can do to negotiate. Um, I think that he has as much of an interest in um, continuing operations at Burgess Pool as the city does. Council Member Combs. So I'm not, I, I would, um, a couple of things. I, I think it's unlikely though that he actually has contracts that extend beyond his contract with the city. Oh, he does. So where he is obligated himself to provide the pool at some periods beyond when he act, his actual contract gives him sort of uh, exclusive rights to the pool. I, I think if his, if his lawyer let him do a contract like that, then, then that is, is, is completely unfair. Well, um, I don't know specifically, and perhaps Mr. Reinhardt knows about that, um, but certainly the, he has the, the teams that he contracts with have a tremendous desire to continue having a pool to operate in. All of the users of the pool, whenever you start, um, for example, my monthly pass, renews every seventh of the month. So unless he stops that um, for each of the users, they are automatically renewed. Now, theoretically, yes, he could stop that yeah. and say as of August 31st, those are stopped. But I, again, I don't think, I believe that Menlo Park is, that Burgess Pool is his largest um, business. And I don't know that he has incentive to stop that. Yeah, so I, I think um, it definitely from the numbers we've seen, it's it's a profitable venture for, for him. So so there there is that incentive. But but I do think that like it's it's probably unlikely that that um, he has some sort of contractual or legal exposure beyond what his his is you know beyond his his exclusive control of of the pool. I have no doubt that if there is if there is contracts with him and, and some other entities that there is a clause that says that like, and if he no longer has exclusive control of the pool, this becomes void or that they end when his, his contract ends because I, he can't contract with something he, beyond of which he has the ability to contract. So, well, it would be, so I mean, the same way you say that your thing is monthly, it, it's monthly. So, but I, again, but if like, he also sells annual passes so that those definitely do not, and, and I'm sure yeah, those go by the calendar year and yeah. not this contract year. And some clause that says like some bear it somewhere that, that you would get like, you know, some specific money back. But it's, it's I guess like I'm, if the majority wants to go in, in the direction of, of, of providing an additional counter offer for my direction, which would just be, be very precise. Um, what you're you're going back to him with, um, and but but the problem is also is that as the days continue to march on, our position becomes weaker and weaker. If 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 there is a desire to not see the pool closed, and so my question then to be if if you're going to sort of go with this sort of say like if we're going to begin this this hard bar negotiation, it's like what are you doing to strengthen your position? You then need to also be telling the staff. Let's start preparing an RFP right now. 
like that has to be the direction because if you're not doing that other thing, then you're not strengthening your hand. And as these days tick, tick on, then, then, then you are actually weakening and, and he, he, his position is becoming more powerful. And so that would be my only thing that like, if that's a direction you're going in, you should also be giving staff direction about like how you can strengthen your own hand um, and be precise with what you want. Well, I will just say, I would shut the pool down rather than give in to these demands, honestly. I just, um, I have trouble with where we are. I think that this is as much of an asset. I think that it's, um, the current contract is very advantageous for Mr. Sheeper. One of the things I would like to do is look at some of the other contracts such as the Palo Alto, um, which I believe has revenue sharing from the first dollar. Um, and I think that this is a very advantageous um, contract for Mr. Sheeper. And it obviously, um, I give kudos to Mr. Sheeper um, for running the pool throughout the pandemic. He was, um, did an excellent job. And I, I, there are many things that he does well, but I think that there are, um, right now, I do not like to be bullied into a position where I don't think it is advantageous for the city. I don't think it's advantageous for the residents. Um, I feel like Mr. Sheeper is likely either watching this conversation or will be hearing this conversation. And I kind of want to go back to my staff reaching out to him tomorrow and seeing, getting his reaction to the council positions. Um, and I, I am the one that's kind of tripping me up is really the five-year one. Um, you know, ideally, I would love to go out with the, the RFPs for both pools. I was one of the ones that suggested we go out for the RFP and do the community process. Um, but the, it's the, it's the five-year. I, I want it to be, I want us to have more time to be able to do this community process. Um, and I think we need at least a year, if not that year and a half. And it's going to be, I guess, in Mr. Sheeper's court to allow us that time to, to do this due diligence that I think we feel like we need to do. Um, so it looks like Mayor Nash has something to say about that. <laughs> well, I just, I think that's exactly where we started, where we asked him to negotiate, we were trying to negotiate a year long um, contract with him to extend until we get the um, new MPCC pool up and running that we were going to put together an RFP and ask for bids um, for that. And that that is what he, and this was his reaction. And so my, my reaction is, I still think that that was the right way to go. And I would like to see him come back to the table. I think in the past, um, well, actually I will just, I will stop there. So, um, Based on my conversation with Mr. Sheeper today, um, it sounds like in February was when the kind of the, the one year contract trigger notification was exercised and that there were a few months that went, go, that went by before the city and Mr. Sheeper were able to start even talking and that there's been, my understanding from Mr. Sheeper, very limited amount of conversation, very, limited back and forth and that he did seem surprised to see this agenda item on um because i i mean i communicated to him that i'm very concerned if he's backing us into a corner and he made it seem like the conversation there's still a conversation to be had um so that's that's what i'm just interested in seeing if there is indeed more conversation to be had or or not but i'm getting <laughs> I would agree with you. I just think that I would not, um, I personally will vote to continue with where staff was with a one year and that we need to have, I would like to see the Burgess pool um, in the RFP with the um, MPCC. And I would love to have Mr. Sheeper continue um, for the next year um, to do that. I just, I personally, I'm not willing to go um, with, I might be 
well, I, I am not willing to go with more than the um, what staff had offered. Um, I am. I think that the two pools need to be um, put out to bid together. And if at some point when we get the RFPs, it makes sense to separate them, then we could do that. But I do not want it. Um, I, I have the assumption that we want to have the same provider um, servicing both pools um, so that we have um, parity people know what to expect across um, the city for pool service. Um, I have a question for um, Mr. Reinhardt or potentially the city manager. Um, so let's play this out. And on August 31st, we are at an impasse and Mr. Sheeper indeed pulls the trigger and leaves. Um, where does that leave us? I mean, I know the pool shuts down because we're not ready, but when would be the earliest that we would have people swimming back at the pool? Or what would that process even look like? Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. So, as as the City Council is aware, um, the staff has been preparing the analysis of the aquatics program um, with a study session tentatively calendared for August 9th. Uh, with the intent was to get direction from the City Council based on that analysis, and then issue a request for proposals, if that's Council's direction at that time, in September, uh, with the idea that an operator would be identified um, through the RFP by the end of this calendar year, possibly January. So a lot of moving parts as to maybe starting with a new operator as opposed to the current one continuing on. But um, in, in some, I think we, we would be looking at a, a minimum of five month uh, time period between August 31st and the time that um, a pool could potentially reopen and, and, and potentially quite a bit longer. Um, but um, those are some of like the timeframe that we're kind of working with right now. Council Member Combs. Yeah, yeah, and I just want, want to point out that uh, I think uh, Mr. Reinhardt's five month is, is optimistic. Uh, um, so we would looking at, be looking at the pool being closed for um, at minimum six six months, I, I could see easily uh, a lot longer given uh, labor issues and challenges um, that lots of, of companies are facing. I just wanna be clear, I, I would prioritize, I, I get a, exactly where my colleagues are coming from. Um, my priority would be uh, keeping, keeping the pool open, um, right, and, and so, I, I would be willing, again, like I say, to um, to, to to take uh, um, or accept positions or, or terms of which I would, in theory, not want um, or would not be my my first choice. Uh, as, as long as, again, for, for me, the priority would be keeping um, keeping the Burgess pool uh, open and accessible. I, I do think we have to sort of um, and and I just want to back up and say, I'm surprised that Mr. Sheeper was surprised that this was on the calendar because this is a public entity, right? And the discussions have to happen in public. Um, and so I, I don't know if he was expecting some sort of um, kind of back room or, or private um, uh, sort of deal, but that that's not the way uh, public entity or agencies uh, engage. Um, and so what is happening here is exactly the way it should happen. Um, but, but what um, for, for, for the public to see and to comment on, um, uh, because again, it, it, it's, it's their resource um, and, and their, their tax dollars. I, I would say that like, it, it seems as though uh, Mr. Sheeper doesn't want to run MPCC. Um, and, 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 and so I do think that we have to like understand it from that position. And so like, if he doesn't want to run MPCC, it's not that he's like, well, um, um, you know, then he would be like, well, this relationship is finite anyway. If that's what the council really wants, if it wants a, one vendor for both and I don't have a desire to run MPCC, then this is, this is a one more year deal anyway. And so maybe I should just cut my losses now or cut my engagement now. And so I do think we have to understand that he could be looking at it from that, that perspective. And it did seem like that 
again, the numbers are not great, but that like the profits went up when he, he, he just was running Burgess. Um, and, and so I, I do think that that, um, and again, like, I, I don't know how those, those numbers, uh, uh, sketch out, but, but at least from his negotiation position, it seems as though losing MPCC or not having it is, is, uh, the Bellhaven pool is, it actually seems to, ha- to be the ideal situation. And if that's the vision of this council, then I think you could see how someone on the other end of, of the negotiating table, um, uh, you know, says like, well, well, then I'll, I'll just, I'll just cut my losses or again, you know, uh, j- jump ship now. Um, but again, like, uh, it, it seems as though just to, it, it seems as though we're, we're just going to go back to saying, yeah, what we offered last time was the real offer. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that like, um, that, 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 again, that's not my position, but I want to just make sure for my own edification that I understand the position that the majority is going in. And, and, that, and that is just to, 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 to go back. And, and again, like, I'm hoping that works out for us. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to be rooting that you guys are right and I'm wrong on this. And I'll be more than happy to say I'm wrong. Um, but but I, do, um, I do just want to make it clear that we're just going to go back and say that, that, that it, it was the same offer again. Councilmember Taylor, I saw your hand up. Thank you, Mayor Nash. I have a, a follow-up question um, for either uh, Mr. Reinhardt or the city manager, Mr. Murphy. Um, just based on the, the feedback you've listened to from council, um, do you believe that there's, there's possibly a middle ground that addresses you know, both sides' concerns? I will thank you for the question. I will take a first pass at it. Uh, City Manager Murphy may want to weigh in further. Um, first of all, I really welcome and appreciate all of the feedback and commentary tonight and direction from the council, as well as the comments from the members of the public. Um, I will say that w- whether there is a middle ground, um, I think if there was a clear middle ground, then we, we wouldn't be in this conversation right now where the terms seem pretty far apart at this point in time. Uh, If there is a middle ground, we're definitely committed to trying to find it. Um, But uh, of what we're hearing um, related to like the length of the agreement and the desire for the RFP to be carried out and for the Burgess pool and the MPCC pool to be considered together, um, the city and Sheepers seem to be relatively far apart on those on those questions. So um, unclear if there's a middle ground there. Um, we're certainly happy to go back to Mr. Sheeper to try to find it, but uh, just for the council's awareness, um, we have been trying to find it and, and here we are today. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, through the mayor, if the city manager could address it. Thank you. I, I think Mr. Uh, Reinhardt said it well. Um, we can um, uh, definitely uh, take it, the feedback from the council's discussion this evening and, and go back to Mr. Sheeper and, and try our best. But yes, um, I, I'm not sure that we would have uh, been here if there was a easy easy pass path forward. And um, at this point, we do have um, f- four council members. I'm not sure if there is a I'm not sure I'm hearing a, a majority, uh, so three members um, in agreement on aspects, but um, yeah, this one is not a particularly easy one, but we are uh, more than happy to go back to Mr. Sheeper uh, later this week and uh, see if there is um, some sort of path forward sooner rather than later and report back to the council, but uh, time, time is of the essence. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And I just just had a, a follow-up question, and this was based on a suggestion I believe Vice Mayor Wilson made about: um, Do you see any benefit of having a council subcommittee participate in that process, or is this something um, best uh, for staff to to address? A conversation with uh, Mr. Sheep. Uh, 
let's see. So I may um, flip it around a little bit to see if if the uh, council would would see a benefit of uh, appointing uh, two people. And so if the council did, then I think the important thing is whether that subcommittee is available for staff or whether the intent is to um, have the direct conversations with Mr. Sheeper. And that's where I would just want to double check in terms of, um, uh, especially given the, uh, just double checking with the number of council members that are able to participate, how, how that um, how that would work out. But, um, but first would be if, if the council would see benefit of that, then I'm more than happy to, to entertain that idea and see if that helps us get to a solution. Thank you. So I've been hesitating to speak my mind a little bit, believe it or not, on this. Um, but I will state, I believe, having followed the pool operations for several years, that there has never been pushback. Whenever the city has, whenever there has been a contract negotiation, um, it, it the city has always acquiesced, given that um, we have only had one vendor. And I think that we are in a situation at this point where it is not advantageous for the residents. I think the residents are being pushed out by activities that by um, other users and that the pool is oversubscribed at this point, that the hours that are available to this um, residents are not optimal, that the pool is not being run for all ages, all abilities and um, for families. And I think it is time that the city puts down the line, you know, holds a hard line and that we say that this, what we would like is one year and that we will be going out to RFP with both pools. I personally think that Mr. Sheeper is very interested in running the new pool in both pools. I, I don't, um, he has been participating in some of the design of the pool, I believe, um, earlier when we were going through the design. I think that um, it is going to be a jewel of the city and that it will be very, um, very desirable. I think that what we need to do is um, push back a little bit, um, that we will be going out for RFP. I think that we need to look at how we run our services and um, really run them for our residents. The taxpayers are paying for these pools. They, um, they should be um, prioritized. We should be listening to what they need. And that is, as um, Vice Mayor Willison said, that is what we are getting um, in our um, survey. Unfortunately, this um, negotiation um, was not going forward. And so staff was had to bring it to council um, in order to break an impasse. Um, and I will just say, I think that it is time that the city says that this is a mutually beneficial operation and not just an operation for the provider. The city needs to um, get, and the residents also need to be getting more out of this. And at this point, we've um, if you look at what the city is providing um, with all of the different paying, um, doing maintenance, paying the um, utilities, I, um, it's in the staff report, I can't remember everything, but essentially the city is um, providing a tremendous amount of support and a pool um, for a private um, provider to essentially run their own program. And yes, it does provide access to residents, but residents are just one of many, many people using the pool. And we need to flip that. It needs to be, our services need to be run for the city. I mean, I'm sorry, the city services need to be run for residents primarily. And then, so I think we should hold the line. And I think we may see a difference in the negotiations. So if I can just ask, when will the council see this again? Um, city Manager Murphy or City Attorney Doherty? Uh, let's see. So at, at, a, at a minimum, we can provide an update at the next meeting of the of the 12th. Um, but part of it depends on whether or not there's actually something to bring forward that's actually uh, a, a, an agreement that 
two parties are willing to enter into because we can't unilaterally do that. So if, if we are unable to come to um, terms with Mr. Sheeper, then um, then there would be no uh, agreement in front of the city council. It would be, we would just pr be providing an update to city council about next steps. So it will depend on how the, the next steps go. Yeah, and ju just to be clear, and the staff report does mention this, the city did receive a notice of termination from Team Sheeper. The notice of termination based on our current effective contract means that the contract will expire on August 31st. So we do have to execute a new contract given that there's a notice of termination on the books. If Team Sheeper were to withdraw that notice of termination, I haven't analyzed whether we could accept that the contract is silent on that so we'd have to look to common law contract interpretation principles um but but the current status is the contract expires on august 31st given that there's a notice of termination on the books right now Vice Mayor Willison. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd, I'd be willing to give him like two years, um, but I don't think my call, I don't think that does serves anybody. Um, I can't do five years. Um, I can live with right now, I get, I, um, sorry, you guys are just trying. Um, I know ideally we'd have, you know, and I, I want, I, I see a benefit in having both pools run by the same operator. Um, but to council member Combs point, keeping the pool open um, is something really important. So I'm willing to bend on the, for the, if we have a, like a two-ish year contract, again, I don't know if that's even on the table for anyone. Um, and then to, to do, uh, separate RFPs for now, but I don't think I have anybody's agreement on that. So, I mean, I would move to that, but I that's that still doesn't get you anywhere. So, so, I mean, so, so I'll I'll just, I'll just stay, stay with my three years unless unless the mayor or council member Taylor are moving. But but you know, well, council member Taylor, please. Thank you, Mayor Nash. I am I am not moving at the moment. Um, however, I I it may be in the staff report, but just uh, based on what the city attorney just said, what was the was there a reason for terminating the contract? I, I think that's a question for Mr. Reinhardt. Um, the correspondence, I can pull it up, but I recall that it was a very simple notice of termination. If negotiations are not successful, I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Reinhardt. I'm probably not summarizing it succinctly enough. Uh, as to the reason why uh, the Sheeple organization issued a, a notice of termination, I, I do not know. Um, I do know that the contract will renew automatically unless one or both parties indicates a desire to reevaluate and reexamine the terms. So both the city and the provider gave that notification back in February, March, when it was determined you know, by the city council to um, you know, issue the RFP and just renegotiate for one more year because the current agreement is kind of evergreen and that renews every year unless someone ends it. So um, what uh, the provider did took it a step further by indicating that no, they're explicitly terminating it if a new agreement is not reached. So, so that's a distinction, right? Because if, if neither party had terminated and there was no agreement reached, it would just renew at the same terms. Thank you. And then that termination letter was received by the city on, on what date? Uh, let me just uh, check the report here, May 10th. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rhino. You're welcome. So I will say one more time, given that 
um, I would go back to, I would shut the pool down if we need to. I believe that Mr. Sheeper, it is not advantageous for him or for the city. And I think that it is advantageous to do a one-year contract and go out for RFP. Mr. Sheeper can, um, is encouraged to respond to the RFP. And um, I do not see a benefit to um, him or to the city by shutting, by him walking away at this point and shutting the pool down. I would, um, I think we stand our ground. Ms. Uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Nash. And I, I agree with you. Um, I am not in favor of, of having the pool shut down. Um, however, based on the feedback, and it's not just from today or yesterday, but just over the past couple of years um, about residents in Menlo Park um, not feeling like the space is a community pool. Um, I'm I'm supportive of your leadership, Mayor Nash, um, and uh, standing our ground um, to make sure that our residents in Menlo Park come first when it comes to services that are be being provided by taxpayer facilities. So I know that there, I believe that there was a motion on the floor. Um, I believe, I'm not sure, but to move things along. Oh, there's not a motion yet, feel there's free. Not, okay. Okay, I thought Vice Mayor Wilson made a motion. Um, but at any rate, um, I don't have a motion, but I'll second one just to move things along. Okay, I will um, move that we ask staff to go back to Mr. Sheeper with a one-year contract. Um, and with the RFP going out for both um, both pools. And I would um, give them some latitude for other, you know, to see what they can negotiate. So that's, that is my motion. Council Member Taylor. I'll second. Thank you. Um, City Clerk Heron, would you restate the motion and call for a vote? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Nash and a second by City Council Member Taylor to offer a one year contract, uh, allow the RFP for both pools and to be open to negotiations. Any further city council question or discussion? Vice Mayor Willison. Um, Mr. Reinhardt, I have an, uh, another question for you. Um, what is the minimum staffing required at a pool just to have lap swimming and open swim? <laughs> like, cause it's one thing shutting down the pool completely. It's another thing if the community, if there's a life, uh, oh, uh, just city manager I, I, Murphy. Yeah, I think Justin, before you go down this line, I, I think Justin really should chime in here because I, I don't know that that's going to be possible, what you're suggesting. I I've just had a question. I'm just curious. I'm fine with sorry. Mr. Murphy answering. Sorry. And, and sorry for uh, body language and, and reacting. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, totally understandable if that's um um i i would just want to caution that we we don't want to start answering that now i can say that we would not be, be simply opening a pool a pool is too much of a specific uh, specialized use there's a number of things that the city would need to really work on so that could be something for a, a down the road discussion but that just my, my main reaction was that that is not a short-term solution for us. So, but totally fair for you to fully articulate your question and we can follow up uh, later. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just not looking to answer that on the fly tonight. I would also like to see um, whatever we decide, what um, that there's a, 
as much focus as possible staff time just to, to wrap this up one way or another um, and to expedite the RFP if possible. And can I just, my apologies, Vice Mayor Wilson, it's just you were commenting and I, I saw <laughs> the city manager. So, That's so okay, I, I wasn't I should, looking, I was looking yeah, at you I, and I didn't see the yeah, city manager. I, I should have so. just let you make your point, which was a fine valid point, but, but my apologies. City Clerk Karen, could you please restate the motion and call for a vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. Uh, so the motion by Mayor Nash, second by City Council Member Taylor to offer sheet for a one-year contract, proceed with the RFP for both pools and to be open to negotiations. Any further City Council question or discussion? I'm just gonna, um, so this is this has been like a mind bender for me. I'm gonna um, address this point to Mr. Sheeper. <laughs> I'm actually gonna be voting um, for the motion um, as with council member Taylor and mayor Nash with the hope that um, Mr. Sheeper will move his position to a place that we can come back and, and further discuss. I, I know you don't wanna further discuss but I think we're still in the midst of a negotiation and that, um, so that that's how I'll support it. If you don't wanna, uh, continue to discuss I just don't want to give away any cards right now I say we go in with a firm position and we see what happens and I I think one of the things well this I, is the it, public process so okay I mean the alternative is I don't support the motion <laughs> um so any further city council question or discussion Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs. So I'm going to vote no. Again, I feel I have to do the caveat that I would be willing to um, to uh, um, acquiesce to some of Mr. Sheeper's terms and, and I am willing to have different RFPs. And so in that sense, I'm, I'm, voting, I'm, I'm voting no. But not that I'm opposed <laughs> to what if I feel like I'm a congressman up here. <laughs> Not that I'm opposed to the motion. It's just that I, I would have a different, a different stance as far as engaging in these discussions. Thank you. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Right. I think Council Member Combs and I are drinking the same um, sauce today. Um, but with different outcomes. And uh, contrary to Mayor Nash's desire, I, I do think this is, uh, I guess, a negotiating tactic that we have to give away on the dais because this is a public process. But I do hope that Mr. Sheeper um, really engages soon and um, put everything he can on the table because I don't think any of us want the pool to close. Um, but I think that the terms, especially the five-year term is, is untenable. Um, given where we are and how much um, we need to just look at where, where we're at with the pool. So I hope he'll allow us to have that conversation with him and, and move forward. Thank you. And your vote? Yes. Thank you. Mayor Nash? Yes. And I will just say, as a regular user of the pool, I am there, you know, four to seven days a week. I do not want to see it shut down, but I also think that um, this is what we need to do it to get it back for the residents. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion passes with city council member Combs dissenting and city council member Mueller recused. Thank you. Um, I would like to take a five minute break as we call um, city council member Mueller back in the room and um, let's be back Actually, let's say right now it's 923. Let's be back at 928. We have a lot of still ahead of us. Thank you.
having our city council back in our in-person and virtual dais. Mayor Nash, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. Our final business item is under regular business. The city council considers recommendations from staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. This regular business item is G1, adopt resolutions for fiscal 2022-23 budget and capital improvement plan, establish appropriations limit, establish a consecutive 1% utility users tax rate through June 2023, establish the salary schedule effective July 3rd, 2022, extend rate assistance program through June 2023, establish direction for administration of American Rescue Plan Act funds and accept award authority and bid requirement through June 2023. To introduce the item is Interim Finance Director Marvin Davis. So Marvin, we're not able to hear you at the moment. I believe it's, uh, you might be still on mute. How about now? Can you can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. So let me repeat that. Uh, good, good evening, Council Mem uh, Mayor Nash, Council members, uh, staff, and members of the public. Uh, it is my honor as the interim finance director to assist with the development of this year's budget, and uh, I will review some highlighted areas within the staff report, and we have a small presentation. Uh, for the changes uh, from the uh, June 14 uh, public uh, hearing. Also, we will have Mary review, Mary Morgan, the Administrative Service Director, will review some of the resolutions, and perhaps Justin will complete with the uh, direction, additional direction may be provided to staff in completing the, um, the budget process. And so the highlighted areas that I kind of just wanted to uh, review in the staff report is that staff considered the uh, service level enhancements that were presented uh, at June 7th, as well as the 14th. And there were a couple of maybes that staff did include within this budget. And, uh, the maybes were associated with a couple of positions. In addition to that staff, um, adjusted the five-year forecast with uh, a few of the requests, changes were made. I think it was Council Member Mueller made a quest, additional requests, and uh, we, will, we have a slide on that as well. And beyond that, we didn't capture any more um, changes associated with the, uh, with the request from June 14. Obviously, we can uh, adjust anything uh, that the Council wants us to adjust. Typically, we will bring back uh, some mid-year amendments uh, around the February uh, associated with the items that we have called out in the staff report. The biggest thing uh, kind of we made was the adjustment to the forecast. After we uh, received the May year-to-date actuals, staff made an adjustment to the uh, general funds forecast uh, as a result of a uh, some reclassifications of developer payments, and we increased the TOT um, forecast as well. The biggest thing being that the uh, general funds end of year balance uh, will be about two, two and a half million less uh, going into the next fiscal year. And obviously this flows through. And so the impact is that the uh, unassigned fund balance for the junior fund that was presented June 14th is reflects those uh, reductions. The five-year forecast, you can see the um, 
and, uh, and of course, uh, feel free to stop us at any time during the presentation and, and just if any items that you consider in questions too. Martin, have you already begun your slideshow? No. Oh, no. Okay, perfect. We haven't begun. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the uh, adjustments will be made to the five-year forecast and you will see them at the slideshow. We're just looking at the uh, staff report now. And uh, the capital improvement plan, we uh, wanted to highlight the total amount of capital uh, projects being, being funded or uh, essentially having resources for us, about 100 million, 102.7. And as you can see, the general fund does have about 31 million in capital projects beyond this current year that are not funded. And that's fine. This is complies with the uh, principles that council uh, approved the budget of principles. And the rest of the staff report is the resolutions. And again, uh, once we finish the presentation, we will have a, perhaps city manager will kind of review the next steps. And so I will start the, uh, the presentation. So, can you see my screen? Just change the display setting. You need to swap that to presenter. Okay. Perfect. Okay, good. That that little feature always kind of gets me. <laughs> okay, so. This is the general funds five-year forecast changes. And uh, obviously this is an attachment. Uh, the, the general funds forecast has a lot of assumptions. So these are the ones that we kind of a change from the 14. Uh, we reclassified um, some estimates uh, that were hitting the general fund that should have been going into fund 332, the Bayfront mitigation. And so this again was one of the results of uh, the beginning fund balance being uh, that less. So we kind of spoke about that. The top annual growth rate after fiscal year 2022, we pushed to 5%. Uh, this, and I reviewed this with, uh, with staff as well as uh, we're getting HDL to give us a concrete five-year forecast. This is uh, staff's uh, inferences, looking at historicals, looking at new uh, things that may be coming on board and looking at um, rates after the pandemic. We also uh, we decreased our ERAF support 10% annually. So over the five-year forecast, it's about a 34% reduction. And uh, you, when you look at the financial model, you can see the figures going down. Uh, we increased the vacancy factor to 6.5%. The current budget has 5%. Over the forecast, we increased it to 6.5%. Um, we believe this is reasonable uh, as you will have uh, staff retiring and in, in, uh, coming on board. We also uh, reduced the expense category by 15%. We looked at the uh, annual... Um, trend of expenses we considered one time expenses for this year's budget and we may and we made some inferences there so overall our um, reserve impacts would be from about 31.9 to 26.5 over the forecast 26.5 being the final year of the forecast the the emergency contingency reserve is maintained at council's a policy level the economic stabilization is about 3.6 million below its target in the last two years. And the unassigned reserve cannot be negative. It's a cash account. And so as a result of that, you would see the emergency contingency reserve being maintained over the period of time. And also you would see the stabilization reserve uh, dropping uh, in year 2026 and then 2027, it would 
it would uh, drop even a little bit more. So these were the big items that um, that we wanted to hit during the forecast. And we have the attachments if council has any questions. And also to uh, if further direction is giving back, we can uh, change the models to pretty fairly easy to change. And so that's probably all I had the review of that. And then Mary is going to review uh, the enabling resolutions. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Nash, uh, members of the city council, staff, members of the public. Mary Morris Mayorga, Administrative Services Director uh, as an Extra Help Retired Annuitant. We have a full list of the adoptions, uh, the resolutions for adoption, and I'll just kind of briefly go over each one of them and what their functions are. The resolution adopting the fiscal year 2022-23 budget and capital plan, uh, that would incorporate the full budget and it would also uh, incorporate the uh, council, any council directed changes, we already know about the item from F3, the $86,000 contract um, payment. And in, in that also there's authorization for payments, which would be uh, debt service utilities, employee benefits that are uh, a part of city operations that need to continue uh, regardless of city operations. Uh, the resolution to establish the appropriations limit. This is an annual appropriations limit. Uh, the uh, calculation is a function that is provided by the state of California and the city calculates that their budget for any payments made by tax supported revenues would be well within that appropriations limit. And that is the case here. Uh, resolution to establish the 1% UUT rates through June 2023. Uh, there's actually two components of this. One is the financial health, uh, assessing, establishing the rates are necessary for the financial health of the city. And that's um, also then the rate itself, which is the, at the reduced 1% level. Uh, the first has uh, two thirds or four out of five uh, member vote re requirement. The other has a majority vote requirement. The resolution amending the salary schedule effective July 3rd, 2022. Uh, we've made an update to this schedule. There was inadvertently um, the PSA uh, contract uh, increase was not included. So we've updated that schedule just for those two positions. Uh, resolution extending the rate assistance program through June 2023. Uh, that is simply to extend the date and the resolution to establish direction for administration of ARPA. So this one, uh, it addresses uh, acceptance of the standard award for ARPA, the $8.3 million. And it gives the city flexibility to determine how to use those funds. It's just stating that those funds would be used with, within the time frame that's required, which is December, 2024. And then the uh, acceptance of the award memo for uh, award level and bid rules, that's in accordance with policy CC-21-024 for goods and services, public projects and uh, claim settlement. And that is, uh, we referenced earlier that $86,000 is included in that uh, resolution or the award memo. So next steps. So, we have a number of next steps. I'll kind of go over and then um, I can uh, pass it over to city manager Murphy if he has anything he'd like to add. We anticipate further direction for the budget on these items. There may be others, uh, but I wanted to make sure the city, city council has these in front of them. So the service level enhancements have been included. Uh, there, there were several that were included as maybes, so they may uh, require further direction. Um, the ERAF reduction of 10% per year beginning fiscal year 2023-24, that was incorporated to reduce reliance on that funding. Um, so that could be another point of discussion. ARPA utilization in the general fund for revenue replacement just in fiscal year 2022-23, as we've established, and we heard that there may be other discussion for fiscal year 2023-24. Uh, 
um, that can be taken care of in the next budget. The utility users tax necessity for financial health that we talked about and the utility users tax rate, which we have at the 1%. And then the discussion also on emergency and economic reserves policy levels that they're maintained in the current uh, fiscal year budget that we're going into. But in those final two years, they might drop below in one of those categories. So something to be aware of. And then um, as part of the budget, then we have adoption of those enabling resolutions and award level uh, beginning before July 1st that we just talked about. Publication of the fiscal year 2022-23 budget in August. Uh, January 2023 goal setting session. Um, we realized the city council didn't have the opportunity to do this uh, in, for the current year. So we definitely wanna make that a priority for the next uh, budget year. And then in February 2023, we would consider mid-year budget amendments. Um, and that is all I have for presentation. Uh, if Justin would like to say anything additional, or we can answer any questions that you have. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So th uh, thank you. Thank you, Mary and Marvin. Uh, I think you did a good job uh, summarizing things. Uh, the, the one additional item I would like to add is related to the earlier agenda item this evening on the uh, uh, ballot initiative and that if the council would like to uh, fund fund that report, it would be part of um, this this budget item. So we would be looking to add um, 80 to $86,000 in the community development uh, budget to um, to uh, cover the expenses of, of such a report. So with that, a um, number of staff has uh, uh, worked on the, the, the preparation of the budget. Uh, so we have a number of staff available for fielding questions. Um, at, at this point, if there's any questions for clarification, happy to uh, answer those. Otherwise, uh, you could open it up for public comment and then at the appropriate time, uh, ask additional questions of staff. And as you start working through the actual action items, uh, we're happy to assist with the, uh, the, the sequences outlined in the staff report. Or if you'd like to take, take things in a slightly different order, we can accommodate that too. Thank you. City Clerk Karen, could you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our regular business item G1, adopt resolutions for fiscal year 22-23, budget and capital improvement plan, establish appropriations limit, establish a consecutive 1% user utilities tax rate through June 2023, Establish the salary schedule effective July 3rd, 2022. Extend rate assistance program through June 2023. Establish direction for administration of American Rescue Plan Act funds and accept award authority and bid requirements through June 2023. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Lynn Bramlett. Good evening again, Council. I know it's very late and I imagine you <laughs> just want to move on to your next topic. Um, I have to say the, the budget process was very short and the public had very little time to give input. And it feels like a very staff staff driven process. And I hope over the coming years, you, you will work to have other methods considered. As per the staff report, the budget was published June 7th and a bu budget workshop held that night, which happened to conflict with the California primary election. And I was actually working at an East Palo Alto vote center that night. So some alternative ideas would be to go to a two-year budget cycle, which a number of jurisdictions near us have adopted. That would give more time for this important process. And Another one is participatory budgeting, where, where the residents have more of a say about what kind of services we want and what we want to enhance. I remain concerned that these requests for staff, more staff did not come accompanied with a detailed job description for each position, and the public is not asked for what services we don't want. 
but my main point and why I hung around to talk is it may be too late for today, but in the future, I ask if council could start to add a one-time amount, such as $200,000 into the budget for the purposes of having a fund available for matching grants that require a local government partner. Um, establishing the fund would not give a commitment to anything, but it would make it easier for community-based groups to work together to develop a grant proposal to respond. Um, I ask because there is a specific opportunity in the form of the National Endowment of the Humanities Creative Placemaking Grant Program. The grant is the Our Town Grant Opportunity. And through project-based funding, the program supports activities that integrate arts, culture, and design into local efforts to strengthen communities. So I've been studying past you know, jurisdictions that got a grant and I'm really excited about this possibility. There are likely others, um, but these grant opportunities usually require a, you know, a local government partner. And so having the money set aside with, you know, with the course of process and stipulations, reporting, et cetera, would just make it easier for us to come before you and then maybe get the grant, which you know, often come about with a short time frame. So I, I know you recently got a BRIC grant, however, the city was approached, as I understand it, by PG&E and Facebook. This pro, a proactive fund, uh, would, to me, would foster a lot of innovation and um, just bring about a lot of creativity. So thank you, Council. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on item G1. Seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. We'll now open for city council discussion. Does anyone want to, Vice Mayor Willison? Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, so city manager, um, Murphy, to clarify then, um, the positions that were maybes, um, we need to actively say yes to those tonight if they are going to move forward in the budget. And can you remind me what those service level enhancement maybes were? Uh, uh, yes, we can, we can pull the, I, I can state them and also uh, pull us a, a uh, uh, table up onto the screen, but maybe let me clarify the, the proposed budget that's in front of you with all the dollar figures includes all of the maybes. So frankly, the we're, and we're trying to emphasize that there are maybes and we, we want to make sure that the council um, is clear about what, what you're approving. If the council directs to um, not move forward with those maybes or move forward with the maybes as provisional or move forward with the maybes through contract services instead or then, then uh, there need to, there would need to be changes to the budget. I'm quite hopeful that uh, we can take those that direction from you and actually be precise with our language and and get that included in what would be a, an adopted budget. So I think we're prepared to make any adjustments this evening. But the the proposed budget does include um, the maybe. So the um, okay. thank you. thank you for that clarification. Great. I. I'm personally in support of the, the maybe, so yeah. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, but I somehow missed that, so so thank you. Yeah. So then, with with the the maybes, the two two maybes, I believe were um, positions within the uh, city manager's office. So one related to the, our communications program, uh, a new position that would require a job description and coming back to the city council for a salary. Um, schedule adjustment in the future. And so that uh, that was one of the two maybes. And I believe the second maybe was the uh, within sustainability, a new um, management analyst level position focused on resiliency. So those are the two maybes. And then there's a, a third position uh, related to emergency preparedness that also would require a job description uh, salary schedule uh, amendment. So those three positions all have similarities in that in the staff report, we said that um, before any recruitment could or would start on those, we would be coming back to the city council because two of the two of the three would require 
new um, new um, job descriptions and a change to the salary schedule. So there'd be a uh, um, a clear check in with the city council, and as part of that, there's a commitment to not move forward with the resiliency position uh, until we bring forward those uh, other two as well. Um, and following up on the resiliency one, um, why would that one be waiting for the other two? Uh, let's see. So part part of it is with this, the overall pacing of uh, vacancies that, that we do have. Um, we, we do need to kind of work through that. Uh, there is uh, a potential for a, a little bit of um, overlap of um, subject matter. I, I think there's there's a, a, a enough enough work for the two positions, but the overlap of the subject matter with the, a little bit of emergency preparedness of just being clear about um, what the what the um, respective roles and responsibilities uh, were. But um, if if there is a if there's direction from the city council to 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 not not delay um, the management analyst resiliency position, uh, that's um, uh, we we can uh, proceed with that as well. Um, I would be in support of not delaying um, that position. I I think as we discussed on the fourteenth that the emergency preparedness coordinator should be dedicated to emergency preparedness. That that's if we're going to go all in, we're going to go all in on that. And then with the resiliency, um, reflecting back on kind of the original climate action plan and the staffing that would be required and um, just how much, how vulnerable we are to flooding and, and wildfire and everything. Um, I think that's a really important position. So I would be in favor if my, if I have support from my colleagues of not, not trying to combine those in any way and in moving forward with the resiliency position, not having to have it come back to council. I would support that. Council Member Taylor. You are muted. Thank you. I, I'm supportive as well, Mayor Nash. And I, I wasn't sure if Vice Mayor Willison had any additional questions. Um, I appreciate that, but I think I'm done. Thank you. I, I just had a follow-up question for our city manager, Mr. Murphy. Um, and, and that is with the positions that are for housing, um, I, I guess I didn't notice this the last time, the source of funds are, are both the general fund and the below market um, rate fund. Is it possible just to have one source of, and make it the below market rate fund? Or is there a reason why there's two? for the housing positions only, my, my question is referring to. Uh, let's see, so um, there, there is the um, balancing act of, um, of uh, the amount of um, funds that are available to directly go to it towards the housing production and a uh, level of staffing that's needed to help enable even providing um, access to those funds. So we've been um, working to uh, recalibrate how, um, how the uh, funds have been used for uh, staff positions over the past few years and we've we've tried to get to the point where we're at a 50% um, for the various housing positions of, of, of each each of the two existing positions and then the third proposed position. So um, there's, um, I, I believe some of the discussions at the last council meeting were maybe trying to in increase the amount of general fund covering the position and to, so that more of the BMR funds are available for housing. So that's, um, we would need to probably do a little bit more research if there's a desire to go um, to tap 
more of the BMR fund um, for, for the funding the positions. On the flip side, if there's a desire to use more general fund for the positions, then that, that would, has kind of the implications for the uh, overall you know, five-year forecast, but it's the, the, the dollar amounts are not, not huge, but there, there is the kind of longer-term implication if there's more general fund money to uh, fund those positions. Thank you. I, I appreciate that information. And I, I'm looking at the um, mid-year um, budget of possibly having an additional um, person for housing, um, just because I feel like we need um, to wrap up in that area. And I would be in support of if there's a cap on the amount of funds used to be MR, but at least that's a source of funding um, for staffing for housing. Um, thank you. And at this time, Mayor Nash, I don't have any, um, any additional questions at the moment. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Are there other questions um, at this point or shall we start? Council Member Combs. Or should we start? I don't have a question. I was just going to make a comment. Please. Okay. Um, I just want to say overall, I am supportive of, of the budget. Uh, there are certainly some items that don't have my individual support, um, especially some of these, these um, items that were sort of more discretionary, but I am in, in general supportive of the budget and will be voting in, in favor of it. Thank you, I agree. And I was um, thinking exactly what do we need um, to, how would you like to march through this at this point? Uh, let's see, so if there are no other questions or comments, then I, I think we could go to the um, slide that had the various um, actions. Um, and I think the important thing is understanding that um, some, some resolutions can be passed with a, um, a simple majority, others require the, the four-fifths. So I think um, it would be important to understand um, whether the, conceptually there could be a single motion for um, to, to pass all, all of the items, or there may be a need for separate motions for, for each of the items. There, it, it, there, there, is a, there is a relationship across some of these various um, resolutions. Um, so, and they are not necessarily sequenced with that, um, that in mind. So I'll just. Actually, let me ask a question of council. Sure. Does anyone want to pull any of these items out from the, um, uh, just passing the entire group? Council member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I'm, I'm not interested in pulling any items. I just have some um, recommendations for our, our, our next budget cycle um, when it comes to the, specifically as the ARPA funds. Uh, so I, I would like to see um, in the future that a, pen, a percentage of the funds are earmarked um, specifically for uh, an, an initiative for residents in Mellow Park. Um, so I'm not sure that that needs to be done now, but that's all, my only comment about the, the ARPA funds. Thank you. City Manager Murphy, is that something that needs to be done separately now? Uh, let's see, so if, if that's, um, I, I don't believe that there's any discrete action that would need to be modified in this as was stated previously, the current resolution specific to ARPA fund provides some flexibility about how it's ultimately spent. So I guess it's whether or not um, that's a, uh, a single statement <laughs> by one council member or whether there should be a discrete motion second about that for consideration during next year's budget cycle or not. So um, I think we, we can kind of approach it e either way. 
So I would support um, that. I don't know how much money um, it would be, but I, I support, um, as I stated at the last meeting, um, having some of the ARPA, ARPA funds um, designated for residents. Um, I also think that it's, um, I would prefer to wait a little bit till we see how everything um, works out with the budget um, before we designate a specific amount, um, which I think is in line with what staff has recommended. All right, so if, unless there's any opposition to that approach, then we can just take that as advisement as we prepare next year's budget. Council Member Taylor. My hand was up from before, and I'm comfortable with what the city manager recommended. Thank you. So it sounds like everyone is comfortable with going ahead and um, passing these as one group. Council Member Taylor. My apologies, Mayor Nash. Uh, there is one that I would like to, to pull out that I will not be supporting, and that is the UUT. Thank you. City Clerk Heron, um, do you need a motion to go ahead and pass these and then pull the UUT out? Correct. Okay. I, would, uh, I can Council assist Member with the motion language, but I'd need a motion in a second. Council Member Combs. Okay, well, so then I would I'm sorry. just one one yeah. thing about the sequence. It may then be best to start with you, and you may be doing start with UUT, and then if then then you deal with the rest. And I think once you get to the rest, there's probably two things that we'll just want to make sure we get part of the record. Okay, so you guys are gonna make me do the UUT motion now. Um, so uh, I will uh, um, move that we. Uh, Establish 1% UT rates through June 2023. Right? Um, or adopt the resolution to establish 1% UUT rates through June I'll, 2023. I'll second that. Uh, yes. And so with the, with the UUT, the, the slide provides the uh, shorthand, but there's um, the two, two components with the um, attached resolution. One is indeed the um, Reduce rates of, of 1%, but the second is the uh, finding regarding the uh, city's financial health. So both of those are in the, um, in the at app applicable attachment. So I'm not sure how one, do, you, do we need to do separate votes for these or? Uh, no, no, so sorry, I just need to get, get the attachment letter. It's, um, Attachment J. So attachment J is structured as a single resolution covering both aspects um, regarding the uh, financial, finding about financial health and the second about the, the reduction. So the finding regarding financial health requires a four fifths vote and the uh, reduction requires the majority. So I think it's, if there's, um, the potential for both of those to pass at four fifths, then you can keep them as a single resolution. If you feel that there's a need to split them into two separate resolutions, we're prepared to do that this evening as well. So if there could be a single motion regarding the attached resolution J that covers both aspects of, of UUT, um, that's, that, that's what's available for you as your, your sort of first option. Councilmember Combs. Okay, so I, I, I think that um, I, I'll go and 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 so make a motion, right? First, in connection with um, the, a resolution finding the financial necessity um, uh, to uh, continue the UUT, um, and that also um, uh, to. Um, um, uh, uh, reduce the rate to 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 one percent, uh, and so so that would be my 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 motion. So that is one motion. Th that is one motion. Yeah, because if I if I can just uh, Council Member Taylor, 
your stance is on both your stance against is, is in connection with the finding uh, of the need, the financial necessity and the reduction of the rate, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to combine my motion. And if I can clarify for the record, that motion is reflected in the proposed resolution at attachment J. So no revisions to the resolution are proposed by council member Combs. Okay, so I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Combs, a second by Vice Mayor Wollison, to adopt a resolution determining that the user utility tax is a necessary for the is necessary for the financial health of the city, pursuant to Section 3.14 of the Menlo Park Municipal Code, and establishing a temporary tax percentage reduction in the user utility tax, pursuant to Section 3.14.130 of the Menlo Park Municipal Code. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? No. Vice Mayor Woolison? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Taylor dissenting. Thank you. And what would the next, so next we can actually pull all of the others together unless anyone wishes to pull any out. Councilmember Taylor, did you want to say anything, do anything? There was uh, one item that I uh, discussed with the city manager earlier, and, and that is I'm support in support of a position um, that the emergency preparedness um, coordinator um, I am, I would prefer that it live in the city manager's office. Um, I know that that is one of the job descriptions that has to be created, uh, but I just wanted to state that for the record. And I, I shared this at the last meeting and not sure that that needs to have any item pulled out. I'm not sure, um, but if Mr. Murphy could let me know. Uh, yes. So, uh, yes, uh, Council Member Taylor and I did, did discuss that and um, as it's currently proposed, it's within the, the police department. That's currently my my recommendation, but I am open to exploring options as we prepare the um, job description and then come forward to, to the city council for that salary schedule amendment. So um, the, the, the full time equivalent is in the budget. The uh, dollar amount is in the proposed budget. Um, exactly where the position would reside. Um, there's ultimately some flexibility, but I continue to currently um, stick with the recommendation that um, we focus on the police department initially, but I am open to uh, other options as we um, actually work on the creation of the position. I would like to um, support Council Member Taylor's um, recommendation that you consider the city manager's office now that we have a permanent city manager. Thank you. Vice Mayor Wollison. Yeah, I'd be willing to make a motion for all these other resolutions if somebody- Please go ahead. Well, if somebody read off, if perhaps- I can help with the language you, if there's a city first or second. Yes, if you, I move um, to approve these resolutions per the wording that City Clerk Heron will um, outline. I will second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Willison and a second by Mayor Nash to adopt a resolution adopting fiscal year 2022-23 budget and capital improvement plan, a resolution establishing the appropriation limit a resolution amending the salary schedule effective July 3rd, 2022, a resolution extending the rate assistance program through June of 2023, a resolution establishing direction for administration of American Rescue Plan Act funds and accept award memo for authority and bid requirement through 2023. Any further city council question or discussion? Through the, through the mayor. So there, I did I'd allude to uh, two potential clarifications. So one is uh, extremely straightforward relative to the salary schedule. The um, 
uh, Police Sergeants Association. Um, is, uh, Morris Mayoga explained that that was just an oversight that those salaries weren't weren't listed. So we do we do have um, those numbers updated. So that's um, related to the salary schedule um, attachment. Is that J? K. K. Attachment K for the salary schedule. And then the second one is related to um, the initiative report that we talked about previously. So that would require uh, um, an addition of um, $86,000 for that report. Okay. Vice Mayor Wollison. Thank you, Mayor Nash. Um, I'm adding those two items that. Uh, City Manager Murphy just referenced Thank to you. my motion. Okay. okay, so we are adding the reference to the uh, salary schedule um, amendments and then the 86,000. Any other city council question or discussions? I just, I have a question real quick. Council member Mueller. Uh, so I wasn't here for the earlier discussion on the report. My assumption is tonight by making the budgetary allocation that we haven't approved actually going forward with the report yet. We're just creating the allocation so that if we want to in the future that can be done or did the council already decide to go forward with the report? We did decide to go forward with the report. Okay, well then I guess I guess you have to make the allocation. So there, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Taylor, did you have any other comments? Uh, thank you, Mayor Nash. And uh, just just one, and that is on one of the attachments. It's just the, I'm support of increasing the, the signing authority for the city manager. Um, just wanted to find out if there's a way for the claim settlement um, that there's some type of, of noticing uh, to the city council of claims, um, settlement claims under 86,000. Uh, let's see. So I, I, we would need to probably confer on exactly how to memorialize it, but I'm um, more, more than happy to figure out a way of um, sharing it. But I, I think it would be worthwhile to actually, um, um, I mean, I can commit to that short term, but I, I think we would have to come back about how to actually document and memorialize that so it's clear for others going forward. So um, I think it may need to be a separate, um, I'm not sure that we can, I, I, I'm not sure that there's a document in front of the council this evening to memorialize that, but I can, I can. Council member Taylor, do you have thoughts? Well, I, I was actually just going to thank Mr. Murphy um, for, um, for considering it or, um, or even figuring out a temporary um, way. Um, it, your response wouldn't have changed, you know, my my position. Um, I'm just uh, wanted to provide a little bit more transparency about um, things that the, that we don't see. So thank you. So just to clarify, you're fine with um, having made the request, and that it'll happen outside this process. Yes. Thank you. City Clerk Karen, I think it's your turn. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Mueller. Yes. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Willison. Yes. Mayor Nash. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the staff who worked very hard to get this budget in front of us. Um, very much appreciated. And I know it was um, quite an accomplishment, especially with all the vacancies and everything going on. We appreciate it. Informational items. 
Informational items are transmitted to the City Council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on the informational items? Thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our informational items, H1, City Council agenda topics, H2, reimagining public safety ad hoc subcommittee update, H3, receiving and filing on the solid waste and water rate assistance program, or H4, connect Menlo community amenities ad hoc subcommittee update, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our informational items H1 through H4. Seeing no hands, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. Are there any city council questions on any of the information items? Excellent, seeing none, we will proceed with the city manager's report. And we can now say city manager, Justin Murphy is here to do the report. Uh, great, th thank, you, thank, thank you, Mayor Nash. I appreciate the, um, uh, the title. I think there's, there is a little bit of technicalities to, still to be had. And so uh, I've been advised to continue to use the uh, interim city manager as my title. So um, until that day comes, uh, um, uh, so I, I'll appreciate, I'll express my appreciation um, at, at a future meeting. Um, let's see. So uh, for tonight, I did want to just um, identify the um, the uh, community survey that was identified, uh, referenced in an earlier agenda topic. And there is a um, shorter uh, URL for being able to access that. It's uh, and, and, and thank you, uh, City Clerk Karen. Uh, publicinput.com backslash community programs is the uh, shortest way to get to the um, to the survey. It is available in both um, uh, English English and Spanish. Uh, I think this 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 URL takes you straight to the uh, English. I think it be, can be translated um, on that page. And that's running uh, into uh, July. We're, we're gonna be working on establishing a, a hard, hard deadline for that right now. It's, um, uh, we're seeing how the initial um, uh, weeks go with it, but um, we hope to be able to report back to the city council on the um, results of the survey at the July 26th meeting. So that's the, uh, the one update I have under city manager reports tonight. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Willison. Um, I just have a follow-up, um, City Manager Murphy. Um, I feel like I read somewhere, I don't know if it was in the, is there a Parks and Rec Commission meeting coming up? I, I, I saw somewhere that there was gonna be preliminary review of, of early um, survey results, potentially by a commission. I don't, honestly, I don't know if I dreamt that or, or I just seem to remember that somewhere. And I, I would be, concerned about that um and i just wanted to know <laughs> did i see that or i just okay mayor nash remembers something like that maybe it's a question for mr reinhardt it did are we hallucinating that there's going to be some early results or uh, will it be revealed once it closes uh thank you for the question vice mayor the Parks and recreation commission and the library commission met in joint they met jointly on june 22nd and they did look at some preliminary impressions from the survey, uh, not results per se, but just like what some of the initial kind of overall kind of broad stroke uh, responses uh, were and the number of responses at that time, just to give them a, an initial look at it. Um, thank you. Can you please provide that to the council? Um, or maybe uh, yes, to absolutely. Or something. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It was published with the with the packet, but we'll forward that. Okay. To okay. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any council member reports? 
So I actually have one, and this is exciting breaking news. State Senator Josh Becker has been working on building electrification at the state level for the last two years. And as part of that effort, um, in addition to just his the bills that he's um, been bringing forward, he's been looking for uh, innovative ideas and models regionally to support. And so he was really excited with Menlo Park Innovation to work with Block Power and put in a, re in a request that is, um, it will be voted on tomorrow, but in their, um, it was published yesterday in their packet that there is $4.5 million um, in the state budget to support Block Power's electrification work in Menlo Park. So that is just super exciting. Um, and he will, um, he was going to come tonight and then there was a lot going on. So um, he will be reaching out to us with more information. So uh, Vice Mayor Wollison. Um, well, I, I didn't know that news. So uh, big thank you to Senator Becker. And I have a feeling that um, EQC Commissioner Angela Evans and potentially Menlo Spark uh, uh, Director Diane Bailey might have had something to do with this. So I just want to thank everybody who's, who's really working collaboratively. Um, and that's, that's really exciting. Thank you. Yes, I think this one, um, everyone is working hard on it. This one, I think, was a deep um, reach into his pocket and he pulled it out. It's, um, and obviously, yes, Menlo Spark is um, right there helping. But thank you so much, Senator Becker. Um, I guess just other comments is I went to the annual ABAG meeting um, last Friday and remotely and um, there we passed a lean balanced budget and learned about upcoming efforts to fund affordable housing and they'll be coming to each city um, as that moves forward to um, get our input. And um, in PCE this last week, um, the, it looks like model reach codes for existing buildings will be um, released very soon, hopefully this week. So any other comments? All right. Um, Closed session. Um, City Clerk Heron, could you please call for public comment on the closed session item K1? Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our closed session, closed session item K1 related to conference with labor negotiator for city manager, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. Final call for public comment on our closed session item K1. Seeing none, Mayor Nash, you may continue. Thank you. And um, I'm, okay. <laughs> um, so I believe what I am, would you like to, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor Nash. We couldn't do it without um, you. I, I uh, don't believe there's gonna be a report out from closed session, but it is agendized. So um, I will turn this over to the city attorney. Thank you, city clerk. There is uh, not going to be a reportable action this evening based on the nature, uh, based on the agenda title uh, for closed session. Thank you. So that means we are um, we are adjourning to closed session and we will not return at the end of the evening. Is that, am I correct? Correct. Thank you so much. We are adjourned to closed session. <laughs>